The Sons of UCF is brought to you by two-time UCF alumnus Drew Bellani and Urban Nooks. Powered by Keller Williams Realty. Call Drew Bellani directly today at 407-456-3226. Urban Nooks, changing the way you buy real estate. Where's your nook? Welcome to the Sons of UCF, only on the Nightline Sports Network. Now, here are your favorite sons, Adam and Mike. Welcome one and all, episode number 8E2 of the Sons of UCF, which is probably being brought to you on the Nightline Sports Network. As always, I am Adam and Mike is with me this week. Mike, uh, Mike, how are things, my friend? Things are doing well, man. Yeah, fantastic. Okay Th- things are good over here. We should start the show off, Mike. We uh, didn't say anything formal out, but a happy Mother's Day to all the UCF moms who celebrated this past weekend. Uh, th- there couldn't be sons of UCF without without the moms out there. So we appreciate and uh, recognize all the moms. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there in UCF land. Yeah, that was a pretty good Mother's Day. Did you do anything special? We just, uh, uh, it was hard to get gifts for the. Yeah, for the moms this year because you can't really go anywhere. Yeah, uh, we what uh, <laughs> I I did get my wife a gift. Um, uh, it, a UCF golf cart. <laughs> no, no, no. Although I did, we did put that on this weekend. Um, it, it's interesting. So she had, she had been mentioning to me that you know she uh, you know she'd been trying to cook some new things. She wanted to. She was tired of making the same stuff for dinner. Obviously, we all have been quarantined, so she's been cooking a lot at home and you know whatnot. So she was like, I really want to. You know, I feel like I do this, you know, the same foods every week. We need something different. Let's sit down and go over what we want to eat. Yada, 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 yada. Got me thinking. <laughs> it always does, Mike. So on Mother's Day, my wife happily opened up her very own air fryer. Oh, those are nice. We have one of those. I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't get the best reception I was hoping for. The kids were kind of like, Dad, really, air fryer? And I was like, look, now we can do chicken different ways. We can put some, some veggies in there, some potatoes. You know, we can we can just mix it up a little bit, some different dishes. She wants Your mother wants to try cooking something new. So we we, uh, we had Mother's Day dinner fresh from the air fryer last night. We had some nice, we had some lovely chicken. We made some potato skins. Uh, we had some asparagus. It was nice. It was very lovely. So we have a, we have an air fryer, um, although it was met with an eyebrow raise and a look of, <laughs> did you really just get me an air fryer? So I'll let you know how, if it uh, continues to work out for me. Well, those things are good. You can cook anything in them. And it, it cuts down your cooking time way down. But I, maybe I can see where she's coming from, you know. Women that typically don't want stuff for the kitchen or whatever. What are you going to get her next year? Like a vacuum cleaner or something? I bought her a Dyson like two years ago. I, actually, I was going to get her a <laughs> – she really wanted a Roomba, but I was like, I'm not dropping like three bills on a Roomba. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, whatever. I, I actually cooked breakfast myself this year. I, I made Eggs Benedict. Have you oh, ever tried doing that? I have not, no. Yeah. I, I have – I've fried an egg before. I've boiled eggs before. I've scrambled eggs before. I've never poached an egg before until yesterday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it went pretty decent. Yeah, I did it. It worked. Okay. So, new yeah. experience. Good, good for you. All right. So Eggs Benedict and Air Fryer uh, sums up the uh, Sons of UCF Mother's Day uh, weekend, Mike. Uh, the show this week, I mean, look, headlines are getting a little scarce. A couple of things with KZ. Heupel said some stuff. Gabe's got some money. So we'll talk through all that stuff. Uh, top eight uh, life stories of UCF inspired by the long awaited Torchy book, which is coming out soon. So we have the top eight uh, and that's pretty much it. My cow of the week. I uh, didn't, uh, I tried, I worked the phones. I, you know, I, I called, I emailed, I tweeted, I texted, I tried everything I could. I just did not, uh, couldn't get a guest lined up this week. So looks like they're stuck with me and you buddy. Aha. Uh-huh. I got you, man. I got you. Don't worry. That's why we're, we're such a good team. I got us a guest this week. You got as a guest? That's right. I got it. doesn't happen very often. I, hold on. It's not like it's, like it's not like your mailman or like, you know. No, no, no. It's not like Speedo Dan or anything. I, I can get okay. Speedo Dan on the phone with you. No. Nope. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I got an actual guest, a big name. We actually brought this name up the last couple of weeks. Pretty exciting stuff here. I don't know if you want me to reveal it now. People probably already know since they clicked on this episode. Yeah, I mean, we're not so. breaking it. So, so a guest is going to call this phone right here. And 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 we're going to be able to talk to them on this show. You set this up. That's, they're they're, they're going to call in. It's it's a done deal. Get the chalk, baby. Put me on the board. Wow. Put me on the board. Uh, I've gotten some other guests in the past. I, hey, I've gotten Hall of Famer in the past. Bo Clark. I've yeah. gotten Dexter. Yeah. Who else did I get? Uh, Schneider. Is this the I, I, I is this the few. biggest name guest you've ever gotten? 
Uh, well, I just told you I got Hall of Famer. I, Bo was, I was listening. Hello, I'm here. I don't know if he's bigger than Bo okay. in UCF, but it's a big name for sure. It's definitely a big name. Should I just tell you now? Well, let's – uh, yeah, why don't you tell me in a second? We'll do a little break, and we'll come back, and maybe you can tell me the guest. If not, uh, you know, you'll we'll all find that together uh, here on, uh, on the Sons of UCF. Coming up right uh, – I don't know, right after this. If you're looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, call Drew Bellani directly today at 407-456-3226. With partner agents in multiple markets, Drew Bellani and the Urban Nooks team can help you in just about any market throughout Night Nation. Urban Nooks, powered by Keller Williams Realty. Changing the way you buy real estate. Where's your nook? And now... Get ready for UCF headlines, mostly. All right, Mike, headlines. It's uh, right before I hit record, I said, let's blast through these headlines really quickly because there's not a heck of a lot going on. Uh, I think I said that every week, so just play that one back every week. But uh, a couple of interesting little nuggets that uh, that popped out this week, Mike. Mackenzie Milton met the, uh, the, the assembled media via a Zoom call. Actually, not assembled because it was an invite-only thing. Still waiting for our invite, by the way. Um, so met the assembled, uh, uh, invited media via Zoom. Uh, it was good to hear from KZ. It was good to hear about his recovery. Uh, you know, he, he was, I think he was brutally honest about where he is and kind of what his goals are. But one of the guys, and I forget who it was, so I apologize if you're listening. You're probably not, so I'm not really that worried about it. But one of the guys asked him to put betting odds, essentially, on him playing in 2020. And KZ responded with a 50-50. My good news, bad news, no news. How do you take that 50-50 betting odds from KZ? I would have taken 50-50 odds, what, six months ago. As uh, Man, that's a big sign. And it's coming from his mouth. 50-50, I mean, but basically we're all 50-50, aren't we? Who knows? Everybody's <laughs> day today, Mike. Everybody's day today. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but 50-50 sounds like... A good percentage. I think that's maybe him trying to understate it because I think he thinks he's coming in. I, I, I see him playing. Man. I, I don't see him not. No way he doesn't play it at some point this season. And if the season gets delayed, we've said it a hundred times. Even more of a chance. Fifty fifty, and we're on. Let's say May eleventh. By July first, that may go up to seventy percent. By August, by September, October, he's in there, man. He's playing. He he did say that he's got a a follow up appointment with a surgeon. I think it's sometime in June, and uh, and you know I don't know the particulars of the appointment. I'm probably not supposed to know because of HIPAA laws and all that good jazz. But it sounds like in his mind that appointment holds a lot of the the key to the next steps, what he's cleared to do, not do. Um, you know, obviously he's got a brace on. It's a much smaller brace than the previous brace. Can he you know can he downgrade to another another brace? You know, uh, explosive movements, cutting. I don't know where he's at with some of that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, full on sprinting. I'm not sure straight line running. I don't know where he's at with that. So it sounds like he's got this, uh, this doctor's visit as kind of the next milestone. And that's where I, that's why I kind of thought the 50 50 was basically saying like, Hey, if this guy says yes, then I'm good. If this guy says no, then, then I'm out. So I, I think he's kind of, you know, putting a lot of eggs in that doctor basket, which obviously is a smart thing to do, but it sounds like that, that visit will hold the key, but you're right. I mean, listen, uh, you know, November 23rd, 2018, Mike, if I had told you, you know, at 11 p.m. that night, that there would be a 50-50 shot, McKenzie Milton would play football again. You probably would have told me I was I was out of my mind. Um, so where we are, you know, fast forwarding, and and again, I don't want to. When I say fast forward, it's easy for me to say that, but McKenzie put in all the hard work, right? He put in all the blood, sweat, and tears to get there. I hope like hell he gets a chance to play, Mike. I we we do this every week, and I I feel like we say the same stuff every week. But you know, you just root for the kid. You hope he gets out there to play. Um, you know, cause it's, it's such an inspirational story and how hard the kids try. He could have given up at any given point along the way. He hasn't done that. Um, so I guess uh, night nation just really kind of waits around now and, and hope that the doctor visit goes well and, uh, and, and we'll see where we are, but you know, 50, 50, it's an eyebrow raiser because it, it certainly is, is probably more than we had thought it would be, you know, like you said, six months ago, nine months ago, 12 months ago, you know, 15 months ago. So it certainly is a progressional step and hopefully it's good news in the right direction. Well, the night of the injury, there was like 50-50 that he would have both legs. Yeah, sure. They were talking amputation. And now 50-50 whether he's going to play again in college. Uh, what You said the doctor visit is in June? I thought he said Come June, yeah, sometime in June. I don't know if it's end of June, beginning of June. Sometime in June he's going back to uh, his surgeon. I think he said in Minneapolis. And we don't know how many more checkups he has between now and, say, September 4th. 
No. He's just the one. Maybe there's another one somewhere in July, somewhere. Well, so if I'm, again, I don't want to get into his HIPAA <laughs> background here, <laughs> but going through the timeline, I, I feel like, and in, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like he went to visit the doctor sometime in January, and I feel like now he's going in June. So I feel like he's maybe on like an every six month kind of deal. Um, cause I feel like it was January right around Christmas time. We were talking about this and, and, and he was, he was going from, I think he was in Hawaii going, I feel like I'm a stalker by the way. Now uh, I think he was going from Hawaii to Minneapolis to see the doctor. I feel like that was around January. Maybe I have that wrong in my, in my head, but maybe it's like an every six month deal until he gets to a point where the doctor's like, okay, now you can kind of ramp up and I want to see you more regularly. Maybe that's how that works. All right. And now as we get closer to the season, if he's really serious about playing, I'm, I'm guessing there has to be another checkup between June and in September, just to, to make sure all systems are to go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, once he starts running, that's the next video I want to see. We've seen the videos of him throwing. If I start seeing him do ladder drills and running around and making cuts and doing all these things, then I'm going to be super excited. But <laughs> if I'm Dylan Gabriel, I'm working out. I mean, if I'm ready if I'm him working out hard, but man, I'm getting a little nervous. The goat is coming back for his job. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be such a t- – uh, yeah, I'll, we'll save that hot take for episode like 92 or, or 98 or whatever the heck number it will be at that point because that's going to be such an interesting conversation topic um, because, you know, Dylan's obviously the future. We all know that. Mackenzie's the, you know, the the, the, the all-time great. Um, you know, I don't think that's hyperbole to say that. So it, it's uh, – yeah, w- w- check back in like episode 97 and we'll tell you uh, about that story because that, that will be an interesting uh, interesting thing coming up. And it's obviously a decision that, that Coach Hypo will have to make. Speaking of hype, one of the things he did make a decision on this week, he decided to go on a local radio station here in Jacksonville, so local to me, not to you, depending on where you are, I guess. If you're in Jacksonville, also local to you. Um, And he essentially said, I don't know if you listened to the interview, Mike, but he essentially said it's inevitable at some point that the college football playoff has to expand that, you know, people really want it. Um, And he kind of referenced, you know, some of the things that are going on now uh, in in the country as some of the the backdrop for that too, Mike. Um, This is a bit of a... A different, you know, change in hype. I don't, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like I don't hear him take these kind of stances very often. I feel like he's very, you know, I just want to go one and zero with lunch today kind of thing. Um, so I thought it was interesting that he said it, um, and and you know, particularly, uh, you know, that he came out and basically said everyone wants it. Did you did you find his comments at all interesting, funny, weird? I guess how did you how did you receive that news when you when you heard what he said? It's happening. It's all. It's happening. Yeah, I'm getting excited. Who the hell knows? Uh, Hypo, you're right. He never says anything. So when he does say something like this, it, it grabs your attention. But he's right. Everybody has been saying it. He's not the only one. They're going to make changes to the college football playoff. Now, what that means for us, we still don't know. Because are they going to add – are they going to make it eight teams? Are all, all eight teams still going to be Power 5 teams? I, I wouldn't put that past them. But I think there's got to be a way where somehow all teams are at least have some kind of chance to get in whether they call it one group of five team, which we would be the leader right now in these last couple of years. It would have been us, Memphis last year. But we'd be fighting it out with teams like Boise State or whatever to get that one playoff spot. And now who knows what kind of changes are going to happen in college football. I've heard today, I think it was the Big tw- uh, no, the Pac-12 saying they're talking about playing an 11-game schedule and playing all conference games. So what happens if conferences have to do that this year? Everybody just sticks to conference schedule. That would give us what? 10 games in conference. It'd be weird because everybody has a different number of games yeah. for one, but then, but then how, how do they determine who makes the playoff? There's no out of conference games to judge teams by. Yeah. And all of a sudden you got sec teams that are, don't have all their six wins. They're not below them because teams like Arkansas, and Ole Miss, and they get four of their wins every year out of conference playing cupcakes. So all of a sudden they're not looking so great. So now the rest of the sec, who have they beat? Who did who did Alabama beat? Because their division stinks, except for LSU. You know, so it would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, will they even have a playoff? I mean, that that's the whole you know the whole conundrum with all this stuff too. I mean, what's the best idea? I mean, off the top of my head, like let's say you you do that, right? Do you take the the top four teams from each conference? And you basically, you know, you you somehow rank, you know, the the teams, and I don't know, you rank the conferences based on I don't know, you know, something, some stupid metric, and then you know, the first conference four teams plays another conference's teams, and you have like a round robin tournament with the top four from each conference, kind of like a bowl schedule, or like this is the here's I say this every week again, so just just you know, rinse and repeat here, but I would feel more comfortable knowing that some of these things are out there if there was one unified person in college in college athletics that I trusted. But there's nobody that like literally in the same day last week, 
you had somebody come out saying, hey, you know, we, we can't play games unless, you know, unless there's college kids on campus. And then the Big 12 commissioner came out and said the exact opposite, like hours later. There's no unified voice. The Pac-12 wants to do what they want to do. The SEC is going to do what they want to do. The Americans are going to do what we want to do. Everyone's doing all those different things. Some schools can't play. Some schools don't want to play. Some schools do want to play. Some schools are going to be on campus. Some schools won't. No one has any sort of unified page. And you're going to tell me the college football playoff committee is the one group I got to trust the most to figure this out? Like, I am so not on board for that. But I don't have any other any, any better answer. It's it, It's frustrating because... There has to be change, but who's gonna who's gonna be the you know the person to lead this change? Who's gonna be the one to come up with the idea? Who's gonna put this together? It's gonna be the same five you know power brokers from all the same five power conferences, and the little guy's just probably gonna be left holding the bag as always. And it just simply there's a, there's a void in leadership. There's a void in, in unity amongst college athletics, uh, basketball, baseball, football, the whole nine yards. Uh, football is probably the most most egregious, and and I just don't see how you fix it correctly without with that void in leadership. I think it's going to be a cluster throughout the entire year unless there's some drastic change from a health standpoint, and people are all starting to feel better about that. If that doesn't happen, I don't know. I don't know how this gets fixed without some sort of a, a wonky situation in, in 2020. I think we're going to find out how little control the NCAA actually has over these conferences because they can't, like you just said, they just said they're not playing football unless there's kids in class. The SEC is going to do whatever they want. The <laughs> SEC is going to say, hey, we're playing football, we're playing football, screw you. We'll get our money from CBS and you know, we'll have our own tournament. You guys can, we'll call ourselves national champion. You can like it or you can not like it, but that's what we're going to do. And who's going to stop them? Because if the NCAA tries to stop them, then they'll just break away from them in the future and then say, guess what? We're not part of the NCAA anymore. Yeah. Right? The, the, the college football playoff is not sanctioned by the NCAA anyway. Well, like, That's been a, a yeah. big part of the debate. Well, yeah, like 100,000 people in LSU aren't going to go to the game because the NCAA said they shouldn't be there. Like, come on, really? Like, they're going to pack the stadium. If you're at home on a Saturday night, you know, down in some natural lights, you're going to watch the game on TV. Like, you're not going to stop. The NCAA is powerless to stop it. So this is where you'd think they come up with an idea or something to try to unify people. But they just either don't have the leadership, don't have the ideas. Or just don't have the balls to do it, Mike. You know, your, your favorite sport, baseball, you know, they're kicking around an 82-game schedule. To me, that sounds perfect, bro. Like, and, and I'm not as much of a baseball zealot as you are. But 82 games, man, to me, like, I'm pumped. That's the first – this will be the first time in a long time I would actually be pumped over watching a baseball season because, in reality, almost every game is going to matter at some point. Um, and, and so it's, it's during a time like this, you need something revolutionary that's going to, you know, unify people and move forward. And, and the NCAA is just a, a – just a complete clown show when it comes to this stuff, man. And it, it's it's frustrating because if you love college football and you love you know your, your team like we love UCF, you know you want to see this stuff work out for the best. But you just have I have zero faith that's going to happen. The problem is, see, in Major League Baseball, they all share money, they all work together, they all have one common thing that they're working towards. In college football, you have 130 different agendas, and then you divide that up. Each conference has their own agenda. Everybody's just out for themselves. They don't care what's good for college football. I mean, they've proved that over the years. The whole playoff system, as the way it's set up now, it shows that. They don't care what's good for college football and what's fair for everybody. Everybody wants to get what is best for them and what makes them the most money. So if the SEC wants to go and do whatever they're going to do, they'll do it. The Big Ten, if they want to play their schedule and, and not play out-of-conference games, then they'll do that. That's what it's going to come down to. Always follow the money in these situations. Whatever's going to make these people money, that's what they're going to decide to do. Well, buckle up. I think, you know, the next, you know, four to six weeks, you're going to start hearing all these crazy things coming out because this is the time where decisions are going to have to be made. Obviously, there are, you know, UFC came back this weekend. Uh, no fans, of course, but the UFC was back. Golf's coming back in June. So this is the, you know, the period where things are starting to, to think about coming back. So buckle up the next four to six weeks. You're going to start hearing some crazy stuff and, and we'll see what, uh, what ultimately happens. Um, but, it's going to be tough to get unity across the board and all that stuff. One thing that's not tough to do is it's not tough to root for Gabe Davis, Mike, and it's not tough to be Gabe Davis's bank account right now. So typically you don't like to talk about a guy's wallet, but uh, Gabe's got a little larger. He signed his contract, Mike, four years, $3.99 million. Like we couldn't really round that thing up to four, by the way, Buffalo. Um, that included a 699k signing bonus. So Gabe is, is locked in. He has signed his contract, and uh, he's looking forward to his first season at Buffalo. Mike, you got to feel good for Gabe. Uh, you know, bet it himself, got out there, and is making some pretty decent money to uh, to start his NFL career. Now, that's 3.99 for the four years total, not each year, right? That's correct. I'm sorry. Yes, that's correct. All right. So he's making just under a million dollars a year. 
you know what? Maybe that extra that point zero 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 one might actually maybe yeah, just make this a thing tax four. Bracket. I don't know. What are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? I mean, who's who's the, who's the account here? Is, well, it's not an even. I was actually reading the account. It's not an even split. I think the first year he's like six ten, and then it goes up every year after that. So it's not an even split every year. But in, in actuality, yes, he's got like nine hundred ninety eight on average a year. All right. Well, definitely a lot more than he'd be making if he came back for his senior year, right? Which would be nice. maybe. So, <laughs> and who knows if that senior year even gets played? Correct. So he, he definitely did right for himself. He's in the NFL now. He's he's got guaranteed money. How much did you say the guaranteed was? I said six hundred ninety nine thousand dollars. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at, right there. I, I'm not signing up for a guaranteed six ninety nine right now. I'm not sneezing. Yeah, no, it's nothing, <laughs> nothing to sneeze at. So, so good and good for Gabe Davis. So, contract signed. Uh, still haven't heard word on some of the uh, some of the other guys. I know we were waiting on word on Jordan Johnson. Uh, still haven't heard or seen any announcements about uh, about about him. Like uh, Brendan Hayes, haven't seen anything about him. Uh, so we'll we'll see. Obviously, we know Nate Evans, uh, Adrian Killens. Uh, Neville Clark and Gabe Davis are all under contract now. I think they've all signed deals, although I'm not sure what the deals are specifically with AK and Nate. I uh, don't know how that works per se, what's guaranteed, what's not, because they're more on the on the UDFA side. But uh, good to see some Knights heading to the pros. Uh, that uh, that always helps. Last one, Mike. Uh, last week, I don't know if you if you knew this or not, but one of the UCF podcasts, they actually had Maury Povich on. Did you know that? I heard about that. Yeah, that's right. With those guys, I, I mean, what kind of guys get Maury Povich on? Uh, I don't know. So, so two lunatics, frankly. Um, uh, but look, look uh, so we, I got some, you know, I got some notes from some people, and you know, some really nice things to say, and 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 so on and so forth. I think that the thing that I, you know, this isn't really newsy, but I don't have any, anywhere else to talk about this. So indulge me for a moment. You know, I, I was finding funny when when we put it out that we had Maury on. You know, a lot of people were kind of like, "No way, is this a joke?" I think they assumed we were just kidding around, um, which is probably something we would do, by the way. But um, a lot of people were kind of like, oh, Maury's terrible. I can't, worst, worst, worst guy ever. Um, and I found that interesting because if you listen into the interview, into the conversation, I think it's pretty clear how Maury ended up to be our, our game day picker. Uh, I think clearly, you know, ESPN had somebody or somebody's else in mind. Uh, and they, they tried those folks and were working on those folks for the better part of that, that early week. If you remember Maury, he had his he had his calendar a little bit messed up, but he had the dates correct. He said he got, or he at least I think he had the date correct. He said he got contacted on like a late in the week on like a Wednesday, which would you know obviously the college game day announces their 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 spot on Sundays. So my suspicion is that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, ESPN was working on some some people. I don't know who, perhaps maybe we'll never know that, but working on some people couldn't get anybody. And I'm going to assume just like everybody else, Mike, they have like a board in the office there of like guys they know they can get on short notice. And Maury's probably right about one thing, like signs at the games with, you know, I'm not your father, lie detector. That stuff does happen from time to time. My my assumption is they looked on the board and were like, all right, we, we're we running out of time here. Who can we get? We went to the big board. Maury's name was there. They reached out. He was a fan. And I think that's how that happened. But for people to think that Maury, like, called up Orlando, called up, you know, ESPN and was like, hey, look, I really want you guys to fly me to Orlando. I really want to do the UCF game. I think it's pretty clear how he ended up there. And, and while you cannot like the decision, I don't think it had anything to do with Maury Povich. I think that he was just a dude answering the phone being like, are you going to put me on a PJ? I'm down there. And I think that's how that all broke out. <laughs> yeah, I think he was very clear about that. And guess what? We picked up a new fan because Maury would never have been a UCF fan before that. And now he's genuinely interested in how we do. And he, and he may follow the program. And it's never bad to have Maury on your side, I wouldn't think, right? Everybody... Unless you did something wrong, <laughs> then you don't really want more on your side, Mike. <laughs> but yeah, but who are the people that don't like more? I mean, the show is what it is. The show is a fun show. It's not meant to be. T- you, if you're watching more, you're looking for serious TV. That I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but it's an entertaining show, and he's been doing it for over 30 years. He's a big name. He's a big time celebrity. I mean, he used to heard all the names he dropped on us. Right? He, he hangs out with Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan and. <laughs> I don't know who else he, he dropped a lot of names. Some names I didn't even heard. I never heard of. He dropped. His dad covered Babe Ruth, going back to the twenties. I mean, the guy has been around forever. If if you say that you haven't watched the Maury show, you're lying. At, at some point in your life, you have watched at least a couple minutes of Maury. Some guy on Twitter tried to tell me he's never watched the show, and then I think he deleted that tweet before I can even <laughs> respond because he knew he was lying. I, I, I was just, I was I was taken back just by how many people were. You know, just again, you cannot like the selection and and be upset that Maury Povich was there, and, and I get it. 
our one moment and you know there's any number of people we could trot out you know we went over them ad nauseum back when it happened and even a little bit last week right any number of people tosh dante Dahlhauser, Bortles, Griffins, you know, Latavius, Antasante Samuel was literally right there. Any number of guys you could have rolled out, even GOL for crying out loud. Um, and, and they, they go to Maury. I get it, but you know, I feel like it was displaced anger at Maury. So, um, and I did. So I, I have been continuing to have conversations with his people. Maury has people. Um, and it sounds like, the, you know, I, I kind of flew out, you know, threw out there, hey, like, we should stay in touch. And they were like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, we should stay in touch. So maybe that's just uh, showbiz speak. I don't know. Uh, but uh, maybe you're right. We've we've got a Maury fan uh, uh, or Maury as a fan now for the program. And, and to your point, what's being plus one with Maury is better than not being with Maury. Well, we do a, a weekly picks segment every week during football season. Maury came on to do the picks for College Game Day. Why not have him come back on? And do the picks with me one week, or maybe have him come back on for the whole season and do picks with us. What the hell? He's going to do it. <laughs> I mean, me I'll, versus Maury this year. Instead of me versus everybody else. I'll check a schedule. I mean, I'll see what his assistant has has working. I want to get to a game with Maury. I want me, you, Maury. Uh, you know, uh, black gold cabana just hanging out watching the game <laughs> and people walking past me like, is that more poked? And just going on about their business, right? Let's get Danny White down to meet him. Uh, you know, let's get, let's get him, you know, on one of those Eric DeSalvo memes or something like, yeah, I, I think this could be one of those like fun program things where it's like, why the hell is Maury Povich here? And it's just like an inside running joke that nobody really knows. I think we can capitalize it. I think UCF's fun enough to do that kind of thing if, if that ever worked out. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just I feel like this was a good time to, to to chat through the Maury stuff. But we appreciate all the kind notes, and you know, some people wrote in and, and they were really 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 happy to have him on and hear the story. And, and obviously, he talked a ton. Um, so it was good to catch up with Maury, and we appreciate all the all the positive feedback. We'll keep uh, we'll keep trying to get you a good guest, Mike. I'd like the guy we have coming up here after the break. Um, we've talked about this guy on the show in the past, and and it, it, he's finally been delivered. And we are going to get to ask uh, we're going to ask the questions, but I guess all of them. We asked them all. Uh, he answered them all, and uh, and you're going to hear all those next. Happy to uh, to welcome our special guest, former AD Keith Tribble. We'll be right up after this. Only on the Sons of UCF. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fagley reminding you to tune in every Sunday morning at our new time, 10 to 11 a.m. on ESPN 580 Orlando for Nightline the Morning After. Brought to you by Chad Barlaw. We'll be taking your calls and your texts reacting to the previous week's UCF sports action, and you never know who will show up. Once again, that's Nightline the morning after, every Sunday morning, 10 to 11 a.m. on ESPN 580 Orlando or TuneIn Radio. Go Knights and charge on. Here's another Sons of UCF interview. All right, UCF was just beginning the, the ascension as a, as a national program when we hired a new athletic director in 2006. He stayed on board to 2011 and saw a lot of interesting things happen uh, during his time there, including some on-campus stadiums and, and a lot of the, the building blocks of the program. So we're happy to have uh, former athletic director Keith Tribble joining us this evening on the show. Keith, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Oh, my pleasure. Let's start at the very, very beginning. You, uh, so if I have this right about you, you were uh, the CEO of the Orange Bowl Committee, and you'd been there 13 years. And all of a sudden, one day, your phone rings, and or somebody calls, or there's emails. I'm not sure what it is. And they, they talk to you a little bit about a, a small school up in Orlando called UCF. Um, so two things. What did you know about UCF, and, and what made you take that call and ultimately accept the challenge of coming on board uh, as the athletic director? Well, it uh, you, you're right. I did not know much about UCF uh, at the time because uh, I think UCF, along with I want to say USF, USF had a probably a better known name because they had a that uh, were doing very well in football at the time, if I recall. And so uh, you're right. I had a friend call and and said that this is an opportunity that you need to look into. Uh, it's in the state of Florida. Uh, it's in a very uh, a great city of Orlando, uh, which is a uh, recruiting hotbed, could be a recruiting hotbed, uh, because all the schools, I know the Florida schools, recruit out of Orlando and, and the surrounding areas. And uh, there were a lot of things that were happening. Uh, they were made the commitment uh, to really be a 
top major uh, program. And um, the uh, commissioner of the conference, Conference USA, and I are very good friends. And I called him about it, and he said, you know, you really should put your name in the hat. You know, you're a Florida boy. You went to the University of Florida for school. You worked in the Orange Bowl. You know, you know most of uh, Floridians, people who would have some sort of insight and, and uh, uh, the institution and would, could help you in the, in the future. So that's how it started and uh, was uh, very fortunate enough to uh, be hired there uh, in uh, 2006. Well, you get on campus. I'm, I'm always curious on these things, like the the first day on the job, right? I always think back to my first day on my job and what was this, what was I going to do today? And and you know, I had a lot of things. I didn't even know anybody yet. But take me back to those first couple of days. Obviously, as an AD, there's so much on your plate, right? There's fundraising, there's programs, there's coaches, there's student athletes, there's facilities. You know, there's meeting boosters, donors, there's all that stuff. How did you sort of prioritize what you needed to work on first? What were the first like one or two things that you wrote down on that to-do list that you wanted to get to get get ticked off as you started in your new role? Well, I thought the first first things I needed to do was to familiarize myself with uh, all the major players, you know, the athletic the athletic staff, uh, the university personnel, uh, and the student athlete. So I spent a great deal of time, you know, talking to each and every one of them or as much as I could possibly talk to them during a period of the 30 to 60 days, the first days I got there. And I had a chance to meet with some of the donors and boosters and season ticket holders. Uh, and as you can recall, back in that, we were just we were about to open up a new stadium, new football stadium. Um, and uh, we had the University of Texas getting ready to come in the stadium at some point. And, you know, we, 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 we really had a lot to get done in a very short period of time. So uh, I just, I, you know, fortunate that my predecessors, uh, both Steve Sloan and Steve Orsini, had done a very good job in terms of the, the program, in terms of the staff, and really setting those sort of uh, building blocks that uh, the program could have some success. And uh, I really, really do believe uh, if it wasn't for their, uh, really the, the efforts that they made, that some of the things that I tried to get accomplished or we did accomplish wouldn't have been possible had they not laid the foundation. And so there was no question that the uh, UCF was – a program to be destined for greatness. There's just no question in my mind. And, and hopefully, you know, through the course of my tenure there, we tried to set out to, to make that a reality. You know, all the fans and the alumni, we were so excited to open up a new stadium and a, and a new arena too, at the same time. That's right. I'm sure, I'm sure there were a bunch of challenges from your seat. What were the, the challenges associated with opening those two buildings that most people probably wouldn't know about? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, of course, the first one was the football stadium to, to really open up. And, uh, you know, we you just don't know what to expect. It's the first time you had an on-campus facility of that magnitude, parking issues. Uh, you know, the university did a, a fantastic job, fantastic job of creating a parking uh, system, which got uh, folks on the, on the campus. As you know, we created the mall where the tailgating is still – if I'm not mistaken, it's still uh, historical now. People really uh, uh, gather to that location. So I think it really was the beginning of creating a tradition at UCF, which is, um, you know, for a school that, you know, had a very uh, short, you know, tenure in terms of football, unlike some of the ones who have been playing for many years. Uh, the stadium really added the extra that really pr began to propel the program, the football program in particular, to high to the next heights and, and of course the basketball arena was out without saying it was it, it probably uh was the the best basketball stadium for a uh college that you uh ucf at that time uh could have ever seen uh almost ten thousand seats uh had suites and club seats uh, some of the major major big time universities who have been around for many many years didn't even have that. So there were a lot of pluses that UCF had that that really, really contributed to his success. Well, it was one of the things kind of that was overlooked that was a big talking point after that opening game. The lack of water fountains in the stadium. I'm sure that's not, <laughs> that wasn't on you, but it had to create a headache, no? 
Well, you know, I think what happened is that uh, sometimes when you go by the code, the code is, you know, as you know, black and white, but the, t- the code does not take into consideration being in the state of Florida in September when it's like, super hot. So you're going to have to make sure you have a lot of, uh, of water. And as you can, as you remember, we did, we did rectify that as at least as best we could the second game that we played here. So, but that was, that was something that, uh, as I recall, we had, it was a, 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 a very uh, interesting time during that period on those water problems. <laughs> well, one of the other things you did early in that was there was a whole rebrand of the UCF. So we changed our logo. We changed yes. our name. We went from the Golden Knights to just the Knights. What kind of part did you have in that? And were there any other options? Would you think of making like a big radical change? Because now, the last couple of years, people were kind of debating whether we should go back to Citronauts and things like that. Was that ever brought up back then? Was it always going to be Knights? Well, we we had a group, a sort of a, a group that studied it. And, and what we tried to do is we tried to get it easy for folks, and particularly that the media, ESPN and the television, uh, to say something simple. As you know, the quicker you can get to it, the better people remember it. And to say the University of Central Florida or Central Florida uh, just didn't, you know, gather. And that's what they, you know, they knew us as. And we wanted to make a, st- a real statement that we were UCF. And uh, it took, it was a battle to get uh, the, 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 the ABCs and the ESPNs to use UCF. But we kept pressing because we thought it was important for the branding and then beginning to change the name to take Golden off of it. Uh, we took a, a little heat for that because that had been something that had been there for, for a number of years. Uh, but there again, we, fe- we felt that if we were just known as the Knights, again, we would distinguish ourselves from, from any other team that had to use the Knights. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, Army is the, the either Black Knights or something of that nature. But So uh, I, I thought it was an important period. And, and the branding for UCF to really try to set itself to a different level. And today, right now, it's a common. It's common to say UCF. It's just not anything that people even think second about. And they know who it is when you say UCF, like the UCLA's and the USC's. And that's what we were going after. You mentioned football earlier, so I, I assume as as you you know debated the job and. And uh, you did your research, you know, you, you studied up on, on the UCF football program. When you got there, Coach O'Leary, George O'Leary, was coming into his third season. Um, we are just gone off our first ever bowl bid. Uh, we went to Hawaii and, and lost a heartbreaker. Uh, as, as you analyzed the football program walking into the job, where did you think the program was at that point? I guess, how did you evaluate what you had seen so far? Well, I had known Coach O'Leary from his days at Georgia Tech, and I had plenty of friends in the industry who knew him and knew he was a, you know, what do you want to call an old school uh, grinding coach that believed in uh, making sure the student athlete was prepared on and off the field of competition and was really, really concerned about the education of the kids. So. I knew if you had those components in, in a leader uh, in our football program that we, we were going to be successful. And, and as you say, we were successful. Uh, I think uh, Coach O'Leary, is, I'm sure no one would disagree with this, uh, did as much to put uh, UCL football on the map as any coaches have been there. And uh, a lot of that's attributed to the type of individual that he was in terms of the ki- how he wanted his kids to to perform. And so uh, I knew that we were going to be good in football uh, because I knew coach Leary was a good, uh, Leary was a good football coach. Uh, But, you know, as you saw over the years during his tenures, that there are times when you, you did turn that corner and you became a good football team. Then you became, you got that target on your back. And we had that a lot of times. And I think sometimes we probably didn't uh, measure up to the kind of team we we, we were exhibiting it sometimes to, to win consistently, but uh, there's no doubt that Coach O'Leary was definitely responsible for where that program is. 
Yeah, I mean, you almost took the, the next question right out of my mouth. So your first three years on, on the job. So uh, we went four and eight, 10 and four, and then four and eight again. So yeah. kind of an up and yeah. down roller coaster. How did you assess yeah. those results, right? Obviously, the, you know, you're, you're the top guy. The buck stops with you. Uh, I look, you know, all transparency. We know Coach O'Leary's, a, like you said, an old school coach. He's a tough coach. I'm going to go on a limb here. I don't know him personally. We actually had him on the show once. I don't know him personally, but I'm going to say he's probably uh, stuck in his ways and he he's very regimented. Did, did you think there need to be changes made at that point? Were you were you able to go to him with some ideas on, on how to get things changed? Or did you think at that point after three years of inconsistency, were you concerned about the trajectory? And, and were you thinking about maybe there, there needed to be changes made on the football program? No, I did. You know, I had a lot of uh, confidence in, in Coach O'Leary and his coaching ability. Uh, I think my role was really uh, to be a sounding board for the coaches, for the head coaches, you know, because – uh, they they have a sense of an understanding of what they want to get done and how they're getting it done. And generally speaking, most coaches, uh, when you're not doing well, you know, whatever, whatever coach you want to you want to talk about when they're not doing well, they're the first person to tell you that there needs to be a change. Now, they may not want it, but they're usually the first ones to tell you that maybe they can't get it done. So. I have never run into a situation where a coach who's who has not performed well uh, over a period of time uh, doesn't really come to that to that realization if you really ask them. And so my role was really try to serve in a role to be a, a sounding board. And there were plenty of times when Coach O'Leary and I would talk about things that he felt we needed to change and. Uh, I would tell him, I, you know, do can we look at this? And he would uh, obviously take that in consideration, as he, as you know, uh, he should. And uh, I just, I believe that if we stayed the course, um, we would be successful. Uh, you know, a lot of things can can change uh, when you have a, 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 any kind of athletic team. Uh, the recruiting, the type of recruiting, losing a kid that's very, very valuable, important to you. Uh, so you, those are things you cannot predict. Uh, but hopefully if, 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 uh, you're able to have all the things necessary to win 10 games, uh, you, you can do that year after year. And sometimes it's not possible. There were rumors. I mean, maybe you can kill them right now around 2009. Were we close to hiring Charlie strong? Was that, was that something that was circulating around the building? Cause that was coming off that, uh, four and eight season that I was just talking about. Yeah, yeah, there's no way. There was, there, that wasn't even uh, 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 you know, a hint of a possibility to do that. You know, I had we had a coach in Coach O'Leary. Coach O'Leary was was uh, was struggling, as you said, but I, I felt very confident as he did that we could uh, we could pull it out. So no, there was never any time that I was considering to making a coaching change. All right, there is one change that you did make. We're going over to basketball now for a second. 2006, 2007, the basketball team was pretty good. And then yeah. the next couple of years, you know, we're only two games over 500. You decided to make the change. Kirk Spiro, who had been a longtime coach for UCF, right. uh, what went into that decision for you? Well, I think there was, uh, a lot of things went into that decision. Um, and sometimes with me, it's, it, well, with me, it was more than just X's and O's. Uh, it's a matter of trying to get a sense of is the program progressing to a level that we need to progress at. Uh, as you can imagine, in that period of time, um, UCF on football was sort of the, you know, one of the go-to teams in football. It was, you know, UCF, maybe Houston every now and then, um, you know, maybe a couple other, you know, Southern Miss. Uh, but we were always in the top two or three most of the time we were, you know. Uh, the basketball was tougher, as you know. I mean, we had some very good basketball teams in Conference USA, and I I just felt that we needed to make a change to try to keep us consistently in the top half of the league. Uh, the league was changing. I mean, the league, the the type of kids that were playing and the type of kids that were uh, uh, in the league were different than what we were recruiting, and so we needed to have a change of philosophy. There is a quote out there that said, uh, "You said we can't win the Kentucky Derby without with a donkey." <laughs> and were you referring to Kirk Spurro at that moment? Because I kind of no, raised no. some eyebrows around the, around the fan base. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what it really meant, and maybe I had a poor choice of words, and I, it meant that you know if if um, 
if uh, Memphis was 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 having thoroughbreds, we didn't have those same kind of thoroughbreds. And we needed to have thoroughbreds to play with the Memphis and so forth. That's what it was a type of kid. We, we needed to have the kid that would could line up and compete. And uh, we just at that point, we weren't recruiting those type of kids because we, we you never had to uh, at UCF because you weren't competing day or day in and day out against the likes of Memphis and so forth. Gotcha. All right. So you replaced Sparrow with former Marshall coach Donnie Jones. Yes. How, how, did, how did you know Donnie was the right guy for the job in your advice? Well, sometimes you really want to hope that you do know that the, that the coach is the right guy. I mean, uh, there's nothing absolute, as you know. I mean, it's it's just a, a a feeling that you have, and you have to put all the variables and and look at it. And I just felt that um, someone who had a familiarity with uh, Florida, with the state of Florida, because I do believe the, uh, that Florida, in particular the state really produces great athletes um, in, in any sport, uh, uh, some better than others. But I think that if, if, if you are recruiting in the state of Florida, you're recruiting some great athletes that can compete. And I felt that way for all the sports at UCF, that we could stay in the state of Florida, recruit most kids in the, from the state of Florida, and both men and women, and still be competitive with a lot of uh, teams in our conference and in, in, in across the country. So uh, that was important for me uh, at that time when we were making the, uh, the change. And uh, uh, so uh, as we went through the, uh, the, uh, the search for those kind of individuals, uh, he com- constantly came up as one who would be a good fit for UCF. Take us behind the scenes. For, for those of us who, you know, who won't ever hire coaches at a high level, which is probably 99.9% of the people listening, <laughs> uh, you don't just apply for these jobs on LinkedIn, right? You're not going to Craigslist to find, you know, head basketball coach jobs. Um, and you, yeah. you, I think you had, you, you served over really kind of two high profile hires in your time there with the basketball program and the baseball program. How do you, yeah. how do these candidates come, or do they come to you? Do you get lobbied by like maybe agents, things like that? Do you have names that you kind of keep in, you know, your top desk drawer that you're kind of chatting, jotting down throughout the years? How do these searches start because again you don't just apply online and hope that somebody calls you back obviously you're doing your, your, your search all along so take us behind the scenes how, do, how does a coaching search start how do you how do you kind of narrow it down and get to your candidate well you're right about that most athletic directors do keep a list of uh, potential coaches uh, either current head coaches or assistant coaches that they have uh, studied throughout their years they either know them personally or Someone in the business knows them and made a recommendation, uh, you know, just as coaches watch tape on student athletes. We watch tape and we watch, you know, games and we see how coaches uh, coach, you know, whether it's football or basketball. And we go to the games and we watch them. So we do the same thing. And uh, and the same thing that happened in this case, you know, I had a list of of names that. Uh, that I had, you know, you have your your far reach, the ones that you have to reach for, meaning you probably have no shot at getting them. But you never know. You never know why someone may want to leave an institution. So you still have to be able to pursue them. Then you have, you know, the, the reasonable ones. And then you have some that will be a stretch in saying of they might be an up and comer that, you know, may have to grow into the job. So you have to evaluate those. Uh, you know, obviously, search firms have been very prominent in the last few years. Uh, most good ADs use search firms just to be the third party because it's not it's, it's not good practice for an athletics director to call a head coach that's under contract at another institution. Uh, there's nothing against that. It's just that, you know, I wouldn't want someone to do that to my coach. So, but you can have a third party, who in this case, uh, a, a search firm, gauge the interest of a particular coach that you may have an interest in. And then that's how it generally, it starts from there. And, you know, some coaches, some ADs are their own search for own search. They do the whole search themselves and uh, they uh, eventually will have the, uh, uh, the coach meet the president and, and key donors and so forth. But uh, I typically used a, a cross section of, of people to interview the coaches um, uh, because I just I want I would like other folks' pr- perspective on this individual, but it uh, it is a process that goes very quickly in some cases. Um, in some cases, you know, it's it's you know it's 
through the latter part, uh, most coaches got into buyouts and you've got coaches who have buyouts and you had to be respectful of, uh, you know, UCF at that time was not like Ohio State where we could, you know, spend a million dollars and buy out a coach we want. Uh, so you have to take that in consideration. So it's a it's a very integral process that, that most ADs go through. Uh, and it's, um, as again, Really, it's it's really starts from us having a list of folks that we really want to go after. Just for fun, can you uh, are you willing to share a name that was on your reach list during that search? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. I don't want to do that. Uh, fair enough. Ask. All right. What are the other uh, you know? I guess major uh, turning points actually also centered around the basketball program. So let me set this up for those who aren't familiar. Uh, yeah. UCF was sponsored by Adidas. We were in Adidas school. Uh, we were entering yeah. in, I think we were in the last year of our contract with Adidas and, uh, and, and coach Spur uh, initially. And then, you know, Donnie Jones, uh, we were recruiting, uh, one Marcus Jordan. So if that name's familiar to anybody out there, Marcus is the son of one Michael Jordan, obviously a, a famed Nike endorser. He had his own Jordan brand. Uh, Marcus has stated in some interviews way back in the day that during his recruiting process, he he asked or he he was um, he was told that potentially wearing a Jordan brand shoe wouldn't be a problem and that those all things would be worked out. Um, and, and obviously, you know, things kind of went went by after that. So my first question for you is, I, I don't know where you were. In the, I don't know if you were in the hiring process at that point, if you were on board yet. But were you aware of any arrangement with Marcus prior to coming to UCF? Was that something that was worked out ahead of time that he would be able to wear Jordans? I was not aware of any kind of commitment for uh, Marcus to wear uh, his father's shoes or, or Nike or Jordan's. Um, obviously, during the process, as the uh, situation <laughs> uh, got uh, exposed and heated up, uh, I became aware that uh, that was uh, discussed, uh, whether it was committed or promised that still remains this 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 secret out there that no one knows but uh and you know once i became aware of it and the kid felt that he was um you know i was i have always been an individual or an ad or or even today that uh wants to give the benefit of doubt to the kids because that's what we're in the business for in a business to educate and and have have kids come to this the institution and eventually graduate uh so um so we had to find a way to make it work because uh, that was what the kid believed was said. And, and uh, I had to, had to go in that, in that direction. Well, to your credit, you, you did honor it. You, you, uh, you let him wear Jordans and he, he did a, a decent cover up job. He wore the sort of the all white, I think they were 11s at that point. Um, <laughs> there was, there was nothing on him. There was a tiny little jump man on the toe. He even went out yeah. and got the Adidas ankle braces to, you know, so if yeah. someone zoomed in tight on the shoe, you'd see Adidas. Obviously, he stepped on the court. And the very next day, I assume you get this phone call. Somebody from Adidas calls, and, and they're not happy. Can you kind of take us through what that process was like? And obviously, you know, we talked earlier about some of the things that you inherit and some of the things that happened in your job. You get the phone ring, and it's Adidas, and it's a lot of money on the line, and they're, they're not happy. How did that all conversation work out? And ultimately, you know, it sounds like they ended up deciding to, to drop our contract at the end of the situation. Well, it uh, you're you're right. Uh, it uh, I did get a phone call, and uh, uh, so I guess it's from the higher ups at Adidas, uh, I guess over in Germany. Um, but uh, I guess the the folks in in uh, North America forgot to tell them that they had worked out an arrangement. But uh, everybody seems to forget at some point, you know. It's just and but uh, so they were obviously, and, and I can understand that they did not appreciate it and. So we had to really try to work out a way to make all parties, uh, you know, happy and hold on it. And again, my my whole, you know, what I was looking to is that uh, we wanted to protect the kid, uh, protect uh, Marcus, and because he was our student athlete, we recruited him to our campus. And so anything else, I had to try to, you know, uh, make it right and do the thing that was going to be and benefit of the university, but also, uh, you know, make, make sure that we uh, protected the kids. So uh, that's what we did. 
So obviously we become free uh, from the contract at that point, right? And and uh, so I'm, I'm a yes. sneakerhead. I'm a uniform geek. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, Keith, that's something I, I every every week I try to see what the combos are going to be. I live and die by that <laughs> stuff. So obviously we're a free agent. There was a lot of you know speculation we would go with Nike or Jordan, but obviously I assume there were other studios, uh, suitors. Under Armour was out there at that point. Um, can you take us behind the scenes a little bit and how you I guess how you decided what apparel brand to go with and sort of how big a deal you think it was at that time to to maybe link up with Nike at that point? Well, I think really it, it got to a point where as we were going through it, you know, we were, uh, uh, of course, Adidas was very upset and, and uh, was going to pull the, the contract from us because uh, they felt that uh, we, you know, were in breach. Um, I disagreed with that, but but still, uh, we couldn't stop them from it. And, and we weren't at the point where we wanted to really cause any ruckus with against Adidas. Uh, so yes, you're right. There were certain people that called and said, Hey, can, would you consider us certain shoe manufacturers? But, you know, at the end of the day, since, since the whole issue started with, with, uh, with Marcus and wanting to wear the brand, I just thought it would be, uh, the right thing to do to go to the brand and really try to work out a deal where, uh, both the kid could be satisfied and the university can be hold and taken care of. And I have to really credit uh, Michael and, uh, uh, you know, there were co- co- many, many nights uh, uh, that I uh, had conversations with Michael and the Adidas, I mean, excuse Michael and the, the Nike folks and trying to get something that was comparable and, and was good for the entire uh, uh, teams, all the teams. At the time. And, and uh, fortunately, we were able to work out something with Nike. And, and obviously, it's turned out super well because they've expanded that beyond compare with uh, where we started. And, uh, you know, I think the brand was something that the kids wanted anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's, I guess, as satisfied with what's happened so far. Another huge topic that's been around UCF forever, and it seems like it never goes away, is the conference affiliations. <laughs> when are we going to move into a bigger conference? Uh, can you take us behind the scenes back then? What kind of conversations were you having with these other conferences? How close were we to ever getting an invite somewhere else? Well, we had constant conversations with uh, with all the conferences that that we felt made sense, whether it was you know ACC, SEC, Big Twelve, uh, Big East at that time, and um, you know the I guess doing the general rule of thumb was. Um, Determining the value that UCF would bring to a conference, especially in television value and and competition, and um, you know today we are UCF is a lot you know bought better in terms of all that the competition, the viewership, the you know the whole nine yards than it was back in at the time we were considering this. But nonetheless, we felt it was important because we thought we had done all the things necessary to be considered. Um, and we were at the end, I guess, uh, about to go into the Big East Conference, which at that time was was one of the top, you know, conferences. There were six of them, and uh, then uh, the shoe fell out with uh, with uh, with the conferences. I guess the I wasn't it wasn't Power Five. I don't know what it was. The name of it was at that time, uh, but they changed, and and uh, the Big East was not a part of it. Uh, and that's unfortunate because I think that uh, UCF uh, in, at that time and even more so today has all the ingredients. I mean, everything from fan support to student support and the, the largest, if not in the second or first largest, I don't know what the number is, but one of the largest uh, student populations in the country. Uh, fans uh, support uh, donations and so forth and competition and academics and so it has all the things necessary to compete at that level the power five level Uh, and I I do do believe that they will be there the university will be a part of a power five conference I don't know what it is I do think there's be some changes in the conferences here uh, in the next five years, but uh, there's no question that they deserve to be there. But uh, yeah, there were conversations, and again, we did have that. Uh, we were going into the Big East, which was going to be part of it, uh, but uh, unfortunately, that that fell apart at the end there, and then 
Uh, no, it is. You know, obviously they didn't put the Big East in the big in the part in the five part five. Excuse me. You mentioned being in communication with all these other conferences, even the ACC and the SEC. Do you think schools like Florida or Florida State or Miami will ever allow us to join one of those two conferences, or they're always going to find a way to keep us out? Well, probably a year or two ago. I mean, if you'd asked me earlier, you know, two years earlier or three years earlier, and I would say, yeah, that would be tough. They would definitely fight it. But, you know, at some point – they're only one vote and uh, in their respective conferences or whatever. Uh, but I do believe that um, the landscape has changed in the last year or two. And I do believe that it certainly has changed now with the uh, COVID-19 that uh, college athletics uh, will be a different uh, sort of uh, product here. Uh, what that will be, I, I don't know, but I know it won't be the same as it used to be. Um, I do know that I predict that in the group of five, which UCF is a part of right now, uh, there will be some real, real uh, uh, strong looks at redoing things because you guys are too young to remember this. You may know a little bit about it, but when conferences first started, they started for the sole reason of being geographically connected, meaning you were in a same footprint. You know, the ACC, all the schools were in the ACC and the Pac-12, the Pac-10 or whatever. They were all there together. And that was for travel. And that was for, you know, not only football and basketball, but the other sports had to travel and compete, too. I foresee us, I foresee realignment somewhere down the line where we go back to that norm and and not chase where television will be because every game is on television now. There's no reason for you to to go and try to get a good television game. All games could be on television. So I do believe that UCF eventually uh, and will be in a Power Five uh, conference. All right. Another big matter that was happening around the same time. The NCAA released yes. notice of allegations report, levied some pretty serious claims against UCF and you personally. Right. When were you made aware of that report? Oh, I can't say when I was made aware of it, but uh, I knew that the, the university was uh, was on an investigation. I mean, obviously, being an athletics director, I would know, I would get that information. Uh, and as it proceeded along and, uh, and the way that they go about doing, you know, their investigation, you know, finally they came to a conclusion uh, on some... Uh, allegations uh, on as you say on on me personally and in the university and some other coaches too but um so i can't i don't know exactly when i was made aware, but i've obviously i did at the end obviously was way aware of it because uh, uh they gave the information to me keith one of the central points of that complaint was uh was around a gentleman named ken caldwell and his relationship mm -hmm. with ucf coaches and administrators uh, for mm -hmm. those for those who aren't familiar, who who is Ken Caldwell, um, and why why was his relationship alleged relationship with UCF coaches and administrators a problem for the NCAA? I cannot answer that question. Why was uh, Ken's relationship a problem for the NCAA? Um, I know Ken was Ken was a young uh, gentleman who uh, was good friends of uh, Ramsa, I think a kid that played with for us, a very good kid. And uh, was um, um, uh, good friends of, of, of him, and so he was around the program. Um, I don't know why they would rule, but I think at that period of time, as you recall, um, we were also on parallel track with with the Penn State uh, allegations. So I do believe that there was a there was a uh, 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 and I, an attitude to show that you know the NCA had um, had poor you know control over what was happening in their colleges and and so they were going to you know obviously set examples. So I, I'm not sure what what they saw or what they believed or anything of that nature. 
in the notice of the NCAA, one of the one of the things that got you personally sort of involved was there there was an allegation that there were email exchanges between you and Caldwell. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, you denied those. Do you, do you still dispute the notion that you had any contact with Caldwell? I never de- never denied in contact with anyone. I never denied that. I believe that I obviously made some mistakes and would do it differently, uh, but I never denied I did contact. Can you share what you would do differently? Uh, probably uh, have a sense of understanding exactly uh, what uh, relationship Ken Mav had uh, and having a good understanding of that uh, and making sure that there was uh, 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 the right uh, systems in place to make sure that there was no appearance of anything. Um, I, would, I would definitely handle that differently. Ultimately, you chose to resign in November 2011. Yes. What What was the final reason for that? Why did you decide to resign as, as athletic director? Well, I, I, I believe that at the point when you cease to uh, be relevant, meaning that uh, during my watch, whether personally or whether the program itself had experienced some uh, uh, difficulties, uh, in this case, NCA situation, that uh, I should no longer lead the program, and I believe that to the day. I mean, I mean, I'm the I'm the leader. I'm in charge. I'm responsible for things that go on within my program, and I think I've never backed away from that from the day I left UCF to to today. Um, I have not, you know, done anything spoken out, said anything, because at the end of the day, I take the responsibility of what happened during the tenure that I was there with that program. You spent over five years there in Orlando, and you oversaw many of the found foundational elements that are still there, still in place today. The ending gets talked about the most, I know, and it's not comfortable to talk about. But from your perspective, how would you describe your overall time and your legacy at UCF? Well, I hope that at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, that it's looked upon that we, meaning the team that was assembled, you know, I was just the, the, the conductor of the, of the organization, the, the leader, that we were able to uh, achieve the goals of uh, building a program that today represents excellence, represents graduating student athletes, represents uh uh, a fan base that that really is excited about being a part of it and has helped build it over the past you know number of years, and that that building blocks, as I said earlier, when it first started, you know I'm not going to say that you know I created this and created that. I took what was started prior to me and hopefully took it to the next level. Uh, and uh, those who who came after me, the two athletic directors or three, two or three athletic directors that came after me. uh, I, it is very pleasing to see that they took that foundation, which was, was, was done back in that, in my tenure there and built upon that. uh, So UCF can continue to be a great institution, not only academically, but also athletically and both men's and women's program, both the Olympic sports and the major sports, football, basketball, women's basketball, so forth. So that I will always be proud of because I get good, I feel proud when I see how well they do uh, in their uh, uh, particular uh, fields of, of, of sport and also how well they do academically. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a sense of pride. And as I said earlier, you know, some of the things that, that did not go my way or, or, or were things that, you know, I would look back on, and as I said, would do it, handle it differently, do it differently. But, I, you know, I take full responsibility because I believe if you're going to take responsibility and believe that you want to you want to be a part of the greatness, you also have to be a part of something that wasn't as great. And uh, but I hope at the end of the day, uh, the uh, whatever UCF experience during that period of time, it was a, a, a sort of a, a, a springboard to the success that they're, they're, they're achieving now. And I uh, only wish nothing but success to everyone ever any associated with UCF program, both the fans, the players, the, the, the staff, the coaches, and, and the administrators there 
because as I said, uh, they will be in a Power Five conference. Keith, have you have you had a chance to go back to campus since you left? Have you been back to uh, to UCF? I have. Uh, I have not been to a game or anything like that, uh, but I've been on the campus because I have you know some friends who who have kids you know because everybody in, in Dade County <laughs> sends to to go to UCF <laughs> now, and that's good. That's good. I mean, you know, you, you want that, you know. Uh, and so I have a lot of uh, friends who call me about the university, want, you know, my insight of the university and so forth like that. And, and uh, so, you know, we are and I am, my family is very proud of, of, of what what's happened at the university, and where they are now. And uh, as I said, we just we look forward to, to seeing it continue growth. I know they have a new president, uh, uh, president now. And, you know, uh, sometimes things happen and you can't control it. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, Dr. Hitt, you know, I had a situation where at the end of the day, you can't erase the good that happened. You cannot erase the good that happened. Uh, and unfortunate things do happen, but hopefully, you know, you can be remembered by the great things that happened. But uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, I believe that uh, the, the, the sky's the limit, and I hopefully one day I can go see UCF play in a national, in a, what is, what is it called? CFP championship game now. <laughs> Awesome. Well, look, we we appreciate your time. We we end every interview. We have some fun at the end here. So we always ask like five five or so rapid fire questions. These could be about music, movies, sports. It could be about anything at all. So uh, are you Ooh. are you prepared to tolerate our five <laughs> rapid fire questions? I don't know. I guess I have to. Wow. Okay. First one's an easy one for you. Okay. We talked about Marcus Jordan. You talked about Michael. Uh, so who's the better basketball player, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? <laughs> uh, LeBron James. Uh, oh, Michael Jordan. Any particular uh, reason you lean that way? I just old school. I like old school. I like I like just the way he the way he carried. I mean, he, you know, he was nothing. I mean, he was nothing by himself. You know, but when he had the team and everything around, I just believe in that team concept. And once the team, the Scotty Pippins and all that, start playing, and he was, he just he just made the difference. He he put them. He made them play better, and that's what you have to do. If I invented a time machine. Would you Ooh. take it to go back in the past or would you use it to go to the future? And where would you go? Wow. I'd probably go back I'd probably go back to high school. <laughs> <laughs> Is this fun times back then? Is this, you those uh, no recruiting periods, you know, when I was recruited, you know, we just I I, I went to we what well, we had ten games. I went on ten recruiting trips. Ten recruiting <laughs> trips. I went on a recruiting trip every week after because we played on the Thursday and Friday, and I would be gone on Friday now Saturday and at you know whether it's Wisconsin, Georgia Tech, you know uh, University of Miami, Florida State, Alabama. I mean, I just so that was I mean from a uh, you know an African American kid in Miami, Florida, going on. I mean that was that was that was the time I enjoyed. All right. Everybody thinks it's cool to, to be the athletic director, right? Working in sports. It's, it's uh, got to be a cool gig, right? Tell me one yes. thing about being an AD that just sucks. Um, I can tell you the one thing that being an AD sucks for me is um, seeing a, a kid that is has get hurt, that has gotten hurt, mm. and he or she cannot play again ever you know meaning they are finished their their college days are gone and and uh they worked all their life for it i mean that's hard that was a hard to see injury career ending injuries or injuries that, that you know because they just a lot of things in life some grown-ups can't take but when a young kid is trying to take a, tra- a tragic thing like that that that's 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 that was tough does, does, second is second is losing. I was okay. say, <laughs> does, does sports become less fun when it's a job? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, you have to love it. I mean, you have to know. I mean, it's just like saying is is golf less fun for Tiger Woods? You know, that's probably you know, he probably loves it. I mean, every day you get to you get to be, you know I, you know how many friends used to say you get to go to a game and and be on the sideline and that's your job. So no, it's it it is it uh, being in athletics is the best job that you could have. 
All right, what's your favorite meal? Once we get out of this quarantine, you got a restaurant, a favorite meal you can go, you can't wait to go get again? Or is it just a home cooking something you get at home? Well, hell, I'm tired of home cooking. I've been doing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably Capital Grill steak. How do you take it? Well done, Me- medium rare? Medium rare. Medium rare. All right. That's nice. All right, you, you mentioned you're a former athlete. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're a big guy. You're a strong guy. A lot of people off the routine right now, and, and so work's going to come up around again at some point soon, Keith. So what's the best time to work out, in your opinion? Should you work out first thing in the morning before you go to work, or should you wait till after work is over to work out? What, what, do, you, what do you think the best time to work out is? Really, the best time is before you go to okay. work. I agree. Because, you know, in a busy time, by the time, you you know, you always talk to your, yourself out of it. Oh, it's five o'clock. Oh, God. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> but in the morning, if you first get up and you do it, it's it, it's it's great. Um, when I was at UNLV and I was a so, senior associate there, we used to work out at noon. Um, instead of instead of really having a big lunch, we'd, uh, we'd work out at noon. Now, that's that's difficult if you, you know, good. You can only do that in athletics because you, you know, you got a locker room, you got a, you know, you got about five or six locker rooms, so you can go in any locker room you want to. But if you're on a, on a job where it's eight, nine to five, it's it's tough to go at lunch. So I say morning. What's your favorite musical act? So Friday, you get out of work, you're on your way home, you crank up the volume. What's your what song are you putting on? What gets you in a good mood? No particular song, just jazz. I love jazz. So I'm going to listen to some smooth jazz, Kenny G or somebody. I'm going to listen to somebody because by that time, you know. And then, and then after I do that, and then when I get get home for the weekend, then I might, I might put on some if there's if there's such a thing, some some light hip hop. <laughs> 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 if there's such a thing, Who do you, who's a light hip hop artist that uh, that that qualifies in that in that genre for you? Oh, I, you know, it's something. Some of Jay Z I can listen to, you okay. know, until it gets a little crazy, but you know, you know. But uh, I like Jay Z. Okay. All right. So post COVID, when this whole nonsense is over, uh, and you can you can finally get out and you can go to one vacation spot, where do you want to go? It could be a place you've been before, or maybe a place you want to go, but that you're, you're getting the the triple, you know, the triple family together. You guys are heading for a vacation. Where are you guys going to go? Uh, Mediterranean cruise. Oh, so you go you go cruising even after all this virus talk? You you don't have any fear of that? Yeah, I love it. I okay. love cruises. I'm just have to bring my own sanitizer stuff and just <laughs> you know you know that. But uh, I don't know if I, you know it's going to be a while. I mean, it's, but uh, I I want to do that because in fact my wife and I were uh, planning a cruise this summer, but uh, I don't think that will happen. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, a cruise, Mediterranean cruise. I, I've been there before, and I, I love that uh, that. Uh, that area. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. One superpower. Probably strength. You know, you know, you know, I don't know which one Hercules is. I don't know, but I don't know. I'm not a big, you know, superpower person, DC comics and all that. You know, I grew up watching Superman, but you know, it was, we didn't realize it was fake, but, you know, it's just something we go. So I'd say Superman type thing. Yeah, you're already a pretty strong guy, I would think. A lot of people say fly. The you don't theory. know. No, I, you know, I, I ain't <laughs> flying as it is anyway, so I don't know. I'm not going to fly. <laughs> All right, Keith, this is a true or false question. You ready? True yeah. or false. UCF is the 2017 national champion. True. <laughs> he knows his audience. He knows his audience. Sure. Nice. Which, so, <laughs> you, you, no, because I, I would have done, I would have done the same thing. Yeah, that's what I was asking. You, would, if you'd have been in that seat, yes. would you have done the same thing? I would have done the same thing. Because at some point, you know, whether people like it or don't like it, they already don't like it. You know, so it's it's not like you are trying to win a popularity contest. I mean, so. You do what is in, what's right by the kids, and what's you know because there are a lot of times in in the in the old days where teams were national champion in the in the coaches poll, and there was another team that was national champion in the writers poll or something like that. And so I, you know, 
I mean, sure, I I liked the fact that people were complaining about it. it I would have done the same thing. Hey, we didn't lose the game. They're still complaining about it. It's three years later, and people still talk about it all the time. I don't know, but you know, hey, who cares, right? <laughs> I got the T-shirt. Right, That's last... all I care about. <laughs> Last one for me. Do you have any of those Unite patches laying around? And so, can you send me one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> Man, I don't know how. But I, I missed out on never getting one of those. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I've lost my chance. No, I didn't. I didn't get one. Yeah. I didn't get one. That's a, that's a tough wreck, Mike. We, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work it out yes. for you. We'll work it out for you. <laughs> Keith, listen, man, we appreciate you jump, uh, jumping on with us uh, tonight and, and, and giving us some insight and obviously answering, uh, answering some tough questions. We appreciate you taking the time and giving us a behind the scenes of, uh, of what an AD does at UCF. Obviously, you, you had some, you know, some really interesting things happen in your tenure, and, and so I'm sure the fans appreciate kind of learn a little bit more of the backstory there. And uh, obviously, we, uh, we hope things are well with you and your family during this time, and hopefully we can catch up at, uh, again down the road soon. Same to you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Raising the bar on what to expect from your personal injury attorney is our commitment to you at Chad Bar Law. I'm Chad Barr, and as a UCF alum, I am proud to present Nightline, the morning after show, Central Florida's only call-in show dedicated to our UCF nights every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And remember, if you or a loved one are injured in an auto accident, call us at 407-599-9036 to schedule your free consultation or visit us at chadbarlaw.com. Our clients come to us in need and leave us family. Offices Altamont Springs. Go Knights. Charge on. Here's another top eight list from the Suns. All right, top eight, top eight, top eight. This week, Mike, finally great news. Our long awaited, you know, national uh, crisis is over. No, 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 no. I don't mean COVID. I mean the Torchy autobiography. It sounds like it's finally ready. Bo was tweeting about it this week. Sounds like you can pre-order some paperback situation. There's an ebook, maybe a hardcover coming soon. So the Torchy Clark memoir, the, you know, I guess it's not a biography technically, but whatever. The, the Torchy Clark memoirs are being published. They will be in the hands of people to read soon. Really excited about that. We can maybe link up with Bo again, Mike, and have him back to Tell us a little bit more about the book and and what that was like. But, you know, it got us to thinking, Mike. You know, it always does. If we could have eight guys who we would write the book about, so the life story of eight people of uh, of UCF past, present, or future, probably not future, um, who would we pick? So (laughs) what are our top eight life stories we'd want to have told? We could do books or we could do movie style, right? You could hit one of these. I'm not sure if you're going to get a 10 part, you know, Michael Jordan situation, but you could do a movie on this too, Mike. So top eight life stories we'd like to hear told. Are you ready? I will read you the eight and Mike, you get to tell me if you agree, disagree, or uh, if I left somebody out, how's that sound for you? It sounds good. You know, the best books do turn into movies. So maybe we'll start out with books and then the best ones get picked out to be a movie. It doesn't have to be a docuseries, but an actual movie. Okay. You know, inspirational movies. All right. Well, we, let's, let's get those directed and, and maybe our number eight selection will make it. And, Mike, I present to you number eight, the Jordan Akins story. So if you're not familiar with Jordan Akins, he signed with UCF out of high school in, in 2010. However, he decided to go play Major League Baseball, although he didn't really make it to the Major Leagues. He toiled around in the Rangers farm system for a uh, for a few years and finally said, you know what, this isn't working out for me, and, uh, and came back to UCF. He was actually a highly recruited football guy, too. He had offers from LSU in Georgia. Stuck with his UCF commitment, played 2014, played really well. 2015, literally, I think at the first game, Mike, he tore his ACL, uh, and he was out for the season. Obviously, that season went downhill pretty quickly. He came back and, and obviously played in uh, in 16 and 17 and is now a member of the Houston Texans. So, interesting story. You could hear about the minor league baseball stuff, You know his knee injury after after coming back to football, going through the 0-12 and year, and then the national championship year. He's got some stuff here. So, Jordan Aikens is my number eight uh, life story I think we should hear. You mentioned big-time recruit. I, I think he's from Georgia, and he got that offer from Georgia. I think he was going to go there and then, until he decided to play baseball. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, his first season with us was 2014, you said? Yes. So his first play, I remember, his first play of his career at UCF was a kick return in a game in Ireland. I think he returned it a pretty good way. He did, yep. And uh, I was very excited to watch him play. He was older than everybody else, obviously, because he came back from playing baseball. Had a very good career. And is now in the NFL. So how old is he now? Because he was playing with us. He was already in his 20s, right, when he started. 
He's got to be close to 30 now, no? Uh, I mean, you're going to ask me these questions when I don't know the answers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me let me get his age. Hold on. Let me. The Google is your friend. Let me just let me Google in here. Jordan Aiken's age. Uh, let's see. He was born in 1992. So you're good at math. Nice. He's 28. But um, yeah, good. Very good story. Very good story. And now he's having a great career in the NFL. So a hell of an athlete. Yeah. All around athlete. Two ports. Two port star. Right. Obviously, to, to get you know uh, drafted and you know get to play minor league baseball. Right. And and then obviously get to get to play big time college football. And now in the NFL, he's. He's having it okay. He's played in, in all uh, every game, I think, uh, if I have this right. Yeah, every game in the last two years. Uh, he's got two career touchdowns. Uh, you know, So we'll see if he can continue his NFL career, but uh, but a good story overall. So Jordan Aikens, my number eight uh, UCF life story we should uh, write a book about. Number seven. Uh, this Again, this guy didn't have as much time at UCF, but his backstory I think was interesting and could be interesting. Our number seven autobiography is by one Mr. Aubrey Dawkins. So to refresh your memory in Aubrey, he played at a prep school in 2014. Then he went to Michigan, played from Michigan from 14 to 16, transferred to UCF in 17 when his dad got the job, sat out all of 17, 18's coming around. Finally, we got Aubrey. He's going to be good. Boom. Shoulder injury out for the year. Comes back in 19, has 15.6 points a game, plays really well, is about six centimeters from sending us to, uh, to the Sweet 16. Uh, goes undrafted and is now toiling in the in the G League with the New Orleans Pelicans affiliate. Obviously, his dad is a, uh, is a is a famous player and obviously a coach now as well. He's got ties to Carolina. His, his dad played at Duke, so how he grew up. His dad coached at Stanford. He went in the Bay Area. So I think there's some interesting life stories we could hear from Aubrey Dawkins. And so the Aubrey Dawkins story comes in at number seven on my UCF life stories. Very good story about you know, sticking with it, coming back from an injury. How different does this movie end with or the book if that freaking shot rolls in and we beat Duke? That's that's the end of the movie, even though there would be another game to play after that, or more games to play after that. But that's that's the uh the high point of the movie right there. And in case you ask me his age, he's twenty five. <laughs> I'm I'm ready for you now. <laughs> twenty five year old Aubrey Dawkins. Hopefully he gets a chance to crack the league. I don't know. You know, the NBA is tough. Uh you know, there's not a lot of spots playing around. Hopefully, he gets a, a chance to crack the league. But, uh, but either way, again, he's been through a ton uh, just his basketball career, and you know, I think it's an interesting backstory. So, Aubrey Dawkins, number six, no, sorry, it's number seven. Number six, Mike, is one Mister Blake Bortles comes in at number six on my UCF life stories. Blake obviously was a kid who was kind of under recruited. I was reading some stuff today uh, somewhere that he he really wanted to to go to Old Miss. Old Miss didn't really have any interest in him, so he did not end up going to Old Miss. Didn't have a lot of offers. Some schools wanted him to play tight end. Some schools weren't sure what to do with him. But he was a pretty prolific passer here in uh, the Central Florida area. Commits to UCF. Jeff Godfrey's there. You know, Godfrey's playing well. All of a sudden, Blake gets in, and he's playing really well. And then, boom, you know, Godfrey's, you know, back at the receiver position. Blake takes off, becomes the number three overall pick with the Jags. You never want to go to the Jags. Up and down career at the Jags. Did lead him to a championship game one year, but you know, got blamed each and every year. His throwing motion got weird every, weirder and weirder every year, too, if I have that right, Mike. Uh, ended up uh, getting released by the Jags. Spent a year with the Rams. Uh, now is kind of toiling around there, but he's also really big in the community. Mike, the Blake Bortles foundation does really great work in the central Florida area, he puts on camps and golf tournaments each year. So he continues to get back to the community. Uh, seems like a quiet, humble guy. You don't hear a lot about Blake uh, doing the wrong things in the wrong places. So for the adversity he's, he's, he's shown, you know, the Jags years alone could be a, an interesting couple of chapters leading UCF to the first ever Fiesta Bowl victory uh, and the stuff he does off the field. I think that makes Blake an interesting story. And my number sixth life story of UCF, the Blake Bortles story. Another story of determination, because uh, most people, you come in as a quarterback and in the same class as you, they already have a quarterback who was basically – Rookie of the year, you know, Godfrey's 2010 season was probably one of the best freshman quarterback seasons we've ever seen until Dylan Gabriel now. And I guess you want to go back to Dante. Uh, so I thought uh, Godfrey was going to be our quarterback for four years for sure. He came in and, and Bortles could have left. And he decided to stick around and it led us to the Fiesta Bowl. The number three overall pick in the draft, the highest we've ever had. If he goes to a better organization, who knows what his career would be? He still was a couple of inches away from going to the Super Bowl, beating Tom Brady. He outplayed Brady, I think, in that game. That Miles Jack's knee was not down. That changes everything. And he goes to a Super Bowl 
and people talk about him differently. Oh boy! Plus, it, he was playing with different coordinators every year. Imagine right? if the First boat of the boat went to the Super Bowl, we would be insufferable as a fan base. My God! <laughs> <laughs> and beating Brady I, yes. I, yeah, on the way there, and who knows if he wins it? Maybe he wins that Super Bowl against the, the Eagles, right? I know we'd definitely be rooting for him. We hate the freaking Eagles. The Eagles suck. Uh, he's yeah. uh, he's twenty eight years old too. Was that the Eagles here? I don't even know. The Patriots were in the Super Bowl so many times. I, don't <laughs> I think it was the Eagles here. <laughs> that was the Philly special, which turned into the Pitt special, which which turns yeah. around to to sock. So, uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, Blake, be a great story. So somebody write the Blake Bortles story, and if you do, that'll be number six on our list. Number five, Mike, everyone fan favorite. Uh, this guy's got a great story. Probably should be higher on the list, but I don't know how you move some of these other guys off once you hear who I've got on here. But the number five uh, story we want to have told is one Mr. Taco Fall. Taco is uh, obviously he's from Senegal. Uh, came over to to the states. Started off in Texas. There were some shady people, I guess, around him. Ended up in Orlando. Uh, then ended up coming to UCF. There was a lot of questions about his eligibility at that point in time. There were some you know some concerns. Nothing he did wrong. Just his test scores. His his academics. He finally gets into UCF. Obviously, he's you know he's a he's a man amongst men. He's seven six. Everyone's gawking at him. You know, he, he wasn't the most refined player his first couple of years. I think some some folks you know made fun of him here and there. Seventeen, you know, he he he, he finally looks like he's going to make some strides. He injures his shoulder, ends up missing almost half the year. Tries to go to the draft, that didn't work out for him. Comes back to UCF, uh, has a has a great senior year. Obviously, again, we talked about it six centimeters away from going to the the Sweet Sixteen. He played his ass off against Zion Williamson in that particular Duke game, one where you know Zion was obviously going to destined to become the number one overall pick. Uh, Taco held his own, obviously nowhere near as athletic as Zion is, but 7'6", 300 pounds is still tough to teach. He finds himself on the Boston Celtics now where he's a fan favorite, Mike. Every game that uh, there's a possibility he can get in, he gets in. Uh, fans are rooting and cheering and, and jumping up and down for him. He has his own podcast, I think, now. I think he's got his own blog. Uh, he's really coming out of his shell. Uh, and such a seems like such a nice kid. Again, you, you can only imagine just the life struggles of being 7'6". Yes, it would be cool to, to dunk you know, on a moment's notice, right? But that's got to come with a lot of life struggles, and it's got to come with some in- insecurities at times, too. Uh, but Taco seems like such a good kid, such an easy guy to root for. And so someone, someone, you know, damn it, write the Taco Fall story. And if you do, he'll be our number five UCF uh, life story we want to hear. Watching him progress his great game was one of the best things ever. When he first started at UCF, he was a little awkward. I mean, you expect that from a guy his size. But he didn't start playing basketball until, what, seventh grade, eighth grade, something like that? He started very late, so he was still kind of learning. But even in his senior year, you could see the progression. And then the last couple of weeks of the season, he got even better. And in the tournament, he played the best games he played in his whole career. But he, he's always been athletic. And, and usually tall guys like that, skinny guys, are kind of I, – I, I, I kind of use the word awkward. But he wasn't that awkward. You he, he, he can tell he was athletic. I remember one of the first shots of him – on campus was him riding around on one of those hoverboards, which you, you can't be, I, I don't think I can blast on those things. We, I haven't really tried, but I was scared. I'd, I'd break an ankle and he was just riding around, you know, like it was nothing. So pretty agile kid for his size. He's 24 years old too. Like I know you <laughs> I know you need to know these things. All right. My number four UCF life story is not a, the most common name that you would hear, but I think this guy's story is really unique um, and, uh, you know, didn't have a ton of time at UCF, so maybe doesn't have a ton of stuff to offer uh, around UCF, but just his story overall is pretty ma- unique, Mike. My number four is a guy by the name of Rory Coleman. If you know if that, if you know that name, Rory was a walk-on from UCF, but prior to being uh, on the football team, he was, uh, he was in the U.S. Army. He was a combat medic. Uh, he received a Purple Heart and an Army, Army Commendation of Medal and Valor for a deployment in, in Afghanistan. Uh, he walked on uh, UCF. He played two games in that 17 years, so that, that undefeated season. Uh, he played against Austin P and UConn. Uh, he was a, he was part of the feature story for uh, for College Game Day, and they did a really nice job talking about you know his journey and uh, you know some of the limitations he had based on um, you know based on his journey through the military. Uh, but what a you know inspirational guy when you get to see the story, and uh, obviously a, a good easy guy to root for. Uh, you know that 2017 team, Mike will always go down as you know the best in UCF history, and and it's it's probably because it, it was made up of a lot of really good kids, a lot of really good people. And, uh, and Rory Coleman was one of those guys, again, didn't make a ton of impact on the field, but obviously he, he served and he led when it counted the most. And so for me, Rory Coleman, number four UCF life story that we want to hear. Well, this guy's a real life hero. I mean, he's putting his life on the line for us. 
in Afghanistan on the front lines. It, there's not many people that can say they did, they, they would do something like that. And played for UCF. I remember him running out uh, with the United States flag yep. before the game. Very emotional for everybody in the stands. Good kid for as far as, more, as far as we know. Maybe we should get him on the show and talk about him. I'm sure he's got a bunch of stories. Maybe not as many football stories, but hey, we talked to Rory Povich. We can talk to anybody. Now. So, <laughs> I've <laughs> actually other stories. I've actually tried. I've tried uh, Rory a few times uh, so far. Not uh, not successful. But if you have a chance, you, you can Google his name. Uh, Google Rory Coleman UCF. You'll see the, the the feature that played on College Game Day. There's a couple of different features out there on him. Uh, and kind of what he went through and uh, and sort of his, his journey to UCF. Again, you know, you talk about inspirational, you talk about, you know, leadership and, and you know, we always, you know, we all guilty of it, right? We, we typically equate football and, and sports to, you know, the battlefield and the art of war and, you know, all this other stuff. Well, this guy actually lived all that stuff. And so, uh, you know, I think his memoir, his, uh, his autobiography would be fantastic. So number four, the Rory Coleman story. You didn't give me his age. Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Twenty six, seven, eight, twenty nine. He's probably uh, close to thirty now because he was twenty six and he was twenty six in two thousand seventeen. I don't know when his birthday is, so I'm just adding the years here. He's close to thirty. He could be twenty nine. Could be thirty. I don't know where he fell on the scale there. I apologize. He doesn't have actually. Hold on. Let me check this link. Let me check this link. Yeah, I don't have his birthday. Yeah, <laughs> some of these other guys easier to find their birthdays. Is this going to be like the the Dan Patrick show height and weight bell where somebody calls and you have to say six two two twenty five every time? Every time I talk about somebody, Ding. I got to tell you somebody's weight or somebody's age. Okay, uh, number three, Mike uh, probably doesn't need a ton of uh, preamble to uh, to explain why this guy is number three. Uh, it is one. It is only Mackenzie Milton. Obviously, I think we know his story really well at this point. Uh, kind of an undersized kid, under-recruited kid, wanted to go to Oregon, uh, You know, didn't get a lot of offers there. Scott Frost comes down here, gets the head coach job. Allegedly, the first person he calls to, to come to play for him is Mackenzie Milton. Mackenzie comes down, plays as a freshman, had a couple of games that just had you scratching your head like, what just happened here? Six turnovers. Uh, you know, was, was clearly a freshman at times in the field. Uh, had a, a, a pretty tough performance in the last game of that freshman year. Got booed off the field against Arkansas State. Thought about leaving, decided not to. Uh, you know the way he tells the story. Dedicated himself to Christ and and got you know found uh, found a higher power. Seventeen, he comes back and he's just lights out. Uh, he won um, uh, the war. The award escapes me. I think I think he won the Archie Griffin Award that year, Mike, which goes to like the best college ba- uh, football player. Um, you know, it just his trajectory is high. Coaching staff change. He doesn't miss a beat. And then the injury takes place, and uh, just the. Um, you know, the perspective he has, the way that he continues to keep his head up and fight. And, you know, it's one of those deals, man, if you're sitting in your in, on your couch one day and you're like, I should get up and go jog or I should really go mow the lawn and you can't find the courage. Um, think about Mackenzie Milton and you you you'll pretty, you know, pretty quickly hopefully get inspired to go do something because th- this kid just keeps fighting and fighting. And uh, one day there will be a movie made about Mackenzie Milton. This I can guarantee you, Mike, maybe you and I should write it. I don't know. But uh, if, uh, if if and when it happens, I can't wait to watch it. But he's my number three UCF life story. Age 22. You want to feel old. He was born. We were already seniors in high school. You're just taking my job, by the way? <laughs> You're just giving out ages now? Okay. All right. We're doing that now. Okay. But uh, yeah, this movie and this book's not yet completed. So we don't know how the ending is. But if it's anything like the beginning of this book, it's going to be magnificent. We've said it many times. The guy is... In my eyes, and I think pretty much everybody agrees, the greatest football player we've had, and uh, the, the games that he won, the, the, the plays that he's made in those games, some of the most outrageous plays you've ever seen, and he's going to come back, man. We already talked about fifty-fifty. I don't get a fifty-fifty. I think he's coming back this season. We're going to see him play again, and then we'll have a proper ending to this story. And, and that probably won't even be the end of the story. The story's going to go on and go on to the NFL or. He really wants to coach. Maybe he comes back and coaches at UCF one day. That'd be a great story. All right. Our second story, Mike, uh, is uh, is another guy that probably doesn't need a lot of preamble. Uh, it is one Mr. Shaquem Griffin. Uh, so, again, for those who aren't familiar with the story, he was born uh, with ambiotic band syndrome, uh, basically had uh, you know had some form of a hand as a, as a kid. It was very painful. There was a legendary story. He actually tried to cut him off himself one night. His parents took him in, and, and the you know the hand was amputated. 
but uh, he loved playing sports. He, obviously, his, his twin brother Shaquille was was alongside with him, and he continued to compete. You know, there's videos of him lifting in the garage with different apparatuses to to keep him lifting and strong. Obviously, he was a fast kid. Uh, he he comes with Shaquille to UCF, and he doesn't see any playing time. He's not in the field. You know, he's not part of the team. And, uh, and, and, you know, he talks about being down about that and trying to figure out what he wants to do next. And, uh, and 2016 coaching change comes and they decide, Hey, we got the speed guy off the edge and the rest is history. Shaquem, you know, set all kinds of records in, uh, in his UCF career. He was a, just a, a man amongst boys in that 2017 peach bowl, or I guess 2018 at that, at that point. But you know what I mean? Uh, you know, Jared Stidham probably still has nightmares about Shaquem Griffin. He went on to, to get drafted against all odds, uh, blew people away at the combine with his, with his 40 time. You know, he's, he's got national endorsement spots now with, with different companies just did the commencement speech as, as, as part of, uh, the virtual, um, graduation along with his brother. Uh, again, this is another guy whose story is, is not far from over the amount of people that he reaches and touches to Mike, because you know, that he, he gives, uh, folks who maybe have something very similar, uh, gives them hope. And, and I know there's videos of him out there meeting a lot of young kids and, and a lot of people who have, uh, who, who've gone through some of the same things he has. And he just gives a lot of people hope. Uh, and he, he's continued his career with the Seattle Seahawks and we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, he, he, he played a little bit more this past season off the edge. We'll see if that can uh, continue to, to progress. But my number two story for uh, UCF life story is the 24 year old Shaquem Griffin. Uh, just, I'm glad you reconfirmed this. You said this is the number two story. I thought for sure he was going to be number one. Uh, yes. I don't know how you can top, top him. Uh, very inspirational story. And he, you know, NFL players, sometimes it takes them a couple of years. And I don't think his career is nearly close to done. I think he's going to have a, a few more years to go and he's going to make a big impact in the NFL. But we saw the impact he made at UCF. And how can you not root for Shaquem? That Everybody's favorite. My daughters, every time they come on, they talk about how he's their favorite. He's always been one of my favorites. It's him and McKenzie, forever. Probably the top two in, in my book now. Passing... The guys we used to love the most, Dante and Blake and those other guys. But uh, I don't know who you have at number one. If this guy's number two. Yeah. You know, I, I guess you go ahead and tell me. I, I will tell you. This, I, I, this one counts. I'm going to count this one, Mike, because it's a little – it's a – you know, once you hear the story, it's it's not exactly, but you'll 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 know why. The number one life story, Mike. I think uh, I think this would probably be a better movie than a book. Um, is one Joe Skinner. So if you're not familiar with Joe Skinner, Joe was a, a high school baseball player from Bishop Moore. He had committed to play baseball at UCF, uh, and then unfortunately in 2015 he was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. Uh, he fought and he fought and he fought, but unfortunately he succumbed in April of 2016 and UCF, you know, even though he never actually suited up for UCF, they still continue to honor Joe. They, they have the Skinner strong movement. Uh, they have uh, jerseys that, uh, you know, that players get to wear, um, you know, after the game, if they are kind of the player of the game, they, they were at the next game. Uh, obviously his parents have, have started a, uh, um, sort of a foundation to, uh, to, to help, uh, help other families out. And, and, you know, UCF has been a big part of that and, and embrace the Skinner family as well. You know, obviously again, Joe never, never had a chance to step on the diamond, but, uh, his, his, his legacy at UCF is, is probably as strong as anybody else's. Um, and so for, for that reason, Mike, I think my number one story, again, probably a better movie, um, is, uh, is the Joe Skinner story. And that's, uh, that's my number one. All right. You got me on that one. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Yeah, what, what a story. It, it is cool the way we still honor him. And the way we were doing it this year, that, I think that was the coolest way to do it with the, with the jersey. And the best player from the game before gets to wear that jersey. And uh, I believe Ru- – I'm sorry, I almost called him Rooney. <laughs> <laughs> Love Lady. <laughs> Love Lady said that since this season was over, this was supposed to be his senior year. They're going to continue that again next year. Yeah. So he's gonna, he's gets an extra year of eligibility. They're going to keep that going again next year and, and do the same thing, which is really cool. Yeah, and obviously the baseball team and UCF has embraced it, and, and you know they're 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 continuing to help find ways to raise money and uh, and honor Joe's legacy. And again, you know, obviously a kid taken from his way too way too soon, and you know had a, had a ton of potential on the baseball diamond. And uh, you know, I think it's a cool thing that UCF honors it, and I think it's a cool thing that his parents are involved. And you know, it could be one of those things where you know 
that there didn't have to be a connection here, but UCF, you know, kept it going. The family keeps it going. And, and so I think, I think the Joe Skinner story will be a cool movie one day. And, uh, and UCF will play a small part in it, obviously, because I think Joe means much more to, to, to folks than just baseball. But, uh, the Joe Skinner story, my number one, uh, UCF life story that you'd like to hear. So if I left anything out, Mike, there were some tough omissions. I know you wanted a George O'Leary story. Didn't quite make it. I'll tell you another guy who I thought about a life story on. Actually, I actually have three other names here that I wrote down that I thought would be interesting life, life story names. Uh, Bruce Miller, for some obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Wh- William Stanback, I think, is another interesting one. And our guy, Josh, Josh Sitton, I thought would be interesting life story. You know, Josh was a two-star recruit. We've heard you know some people talk about how O'Leary just made fun of him merciless, mercilessly. Uh, I can't say that word about well, mercilessly. Um, and uh, <laughs> he, he came back and was ended up being a, a fourth-round pick and, and played a, a bunch of years in the NFL. He's got a foundation that he's a part of now. Uh, so Josh Sitton was another option too, but, uh, th- those, those are, our, those are our eight. If you got, if you got another one we're missing out on, this is probably a little recency bias list too, by the way, Mike, as I look at this, I don't think anybody's been uh, at UCF prior to 2014, I guess, if you count <laughs> Jordan Akins is maybe 10. So there's probably apologies to Mark Rhodes and, and, uh, the Giovanetti's and some of those other guys I'm sure from getting, uh, you know, the Mark nonsense. I apologize that your story didn't get made. Maybe this is some recency bias on my part, but the top eight UCF life stories, Mike. Well, everybody accuses UCF fans of not being coming around to the last three years anyway. So I guess we'll, we'll add to that stereotype. Well, yeah. that's, well, that's fair. But I also think that as I was going, I was a legit trying to find, right. You could have gone the Dante story. I think the Dante story would have been a well, decent one, right? I told you who I would have had on my list. Torchy. But then that's how we got the whole thing with the torchy book. It's already coming out, yeah, yeah. I think, but I think what goes to show you too is just a kind of the times we're in now, right? Back back in those days, you didn't you didn't hear a lot about these guys, right? You didn't know some of their stories, you didn't know anything about them um, because you know there wasn't social media. You didn't have an opportunity to interact with these guys. Uh, you know, and, and now, I mean, you, the UCF community does such a great job embracing these kids. UCF does a great job sharing their stories. Obviously there's, there's a lot more access to, to videos on the internet, YouTube and interviews, uh, you know, games are on TV. Now you get to know these guys and these names a little closer. So, you know, maybe the recency bias thing isn't so much recency bias as it is technology bias, that there's more ability to connect with these guys. But either way, I think these would be eight cool stories. I'm sure I missed a hundred more. So you can, uh, you can find me on Twitter at sounds UCF and feel free to call me an idiot. You won't be the first and you probably won't be the last, but coming up next, Mike, it is the last segment of the show. We call this cow of the week. We'll take a pause here and, uh, you will ask me who should the cow of the week be. We'll talk it out, and then we'll come back on the other side, and no one will know any different. If we didn't have to play the Danny White thing in between, we could just talk it out right now on air. But But we do. We'll be back. All right. Take it away, Danny. I'm Jeff Allen. Coming up on this week's AAC report only on the Nightline Sports Network, I'll be joined by AAC Commissioner Mike Oresco. We'll talk about when the sports world came to a halt just before the men's basketball tournament, the prospects of when collegiate sports may resume, and the changes in the American with UConn's departure and more. That's on this week's AAC report only on the Nightline Sports Network. This is UCF Athletic Director Danny White, and if you don't want to be the cow of the week, you need to listen to Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Charge on. Go Knights. All right, Danny has spoken. Mike and I have talked it out, so we will uh, we will reveal exclusively on the show our cows of the week coming up in a moment, Mike. But former Athletic Director Keith Tribble joined the show, and, uh, and he hung in there. He answered uh, every question we asked him. Um, Obviously, some he was probably more interested in answering than others, but uh, he hung in and answered every question. I think some of the stuff he said was interesting, but uh, we've been talking about him and, and sort of his his role at UCF for a while. So I, I'll give him give him kudos for for calling in and uh, and living up to uh, the commitment to to join us. And uh, you know, I think he he gave some good stories about some of the things that we maybe didn't know about, didn't hear about, but. Uh, Ultimately, I'll, I'll give him respect for joining in uh, and answering all the questions. Hopefully, we asked all the right ones. I mean, I guess you guys will tell us. Uh, but you know, we want to want to get in and ask uh, as much as we could about uh, about his time at UCF. And uh, and you know, he he hung in and he answered most of them. All right. He was around for a very important time at UCF. A big transitional period, moving into a new stadium, a new arena, changing logos. He was involved in all that stuff. It wasn't all just the stuff there at the end. It was a lot of stuff that he was here for. 
but yeah, obviously we had to talk about the controversial stuff there with the NTA allegations and all that stuff. And we did ask them and that's all we can do is ask, you know, whatever you want us to go into detail about it, but there's nothing we can do about that. But uh, we, we brought up everything, his relationship with coach O'Leary and, and the firing of Spiro. I think we did a pretty decent job covering the whole timeline there with him. So. Yeah, I mean, we heard some interesting stuff. I mean, the you know, we we've heard the 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 Nike Adidas shoe stuff from the other end from Marcus Jordan's side. We haven't really heard from UCF side, so it was interesting to kind of hear his recollection uh, of how that came about. And you know, obviously, he you know, if you're right between the lines on where he thought the communication breakdown mm-hmm. took place, I think it was pretty easy to to figure that part out. So, some of the UCF rebrand, and he's right. I mean, think about it now, Mike. I mean, back then we were fighting, you know, we were, well, we were C dot Florida for the longest time, which Cal fans won't let us live down, of course. And, um, and now it's used, it's, it's like, you don't even hear or read central Florida anymore. It means typically 98% of the time you're reading, it says UCF. And obviously, you know, the winning and the the success had a lot, a lot to do with that, but you know, he was obviously one of the first ones in, in the team at that point to decide, Hey, we, we need to be UCF. We don't need to be central Florida. You know, we don't need the golden, even though everyone gives us the golden name still for some reason. But, um, you know, he had the foresight to think through some of that stuff. So you got to give him credit for, for some of those, uh, some of those things that, uh, you know, that they were able to accomplish. And obviously the stadiums, you know, even though he didn't fundraise for both of those, uh, getting those stadiums built and getting them open, you know, obviously there was always going to be issues, but, uh, you know, he, he was, he was a big part of all that stuff. And it's tough to ignore that stuff. Obviously the the other stuff kind of outweighs it for most people. And, and, you know, I get why that is, but, uh, he certainly did, you know, didn't did his fair share on the other end as well. And, you know, overall glad we were able to have him come on and uh, address some things. And, and hopefully he, you know, he, he shared some stuff from his standpoint and, you know, and as the audience, you get to feel about it, how you want to feel about it. All right. It would have been very easy for him to say, no, I don't want to come on your show. <laughs> you know, we called him. We said, Hey, would you mind coming on and speaking to us about your time at UCF? And he was very, gracious and courteous and he said yes i have no problem doing it and he came on so i give him a lot of respect for that and it seemed like a good guy i, I, I mean answered all the questions and <laughs> answered every question you know as much as he could yeah so. as much as he, he chose to but uh either way uh, hopefully you you enjoyed hearing that's our first athletic director on the show michael that was actually cool uh uh steve orsini looking at you steve sloan let us know hit us up you know, uh, actually, I guess we had GOL on. Do we count oh, GOL as a... I, well, we've had Danny White. Yeah, Danny White. I mean, sure. Fair. Fair. <laughs> All right. Never mind. It's our third AD on. <laughs> Speaking of Cal of the Week. We, we've had Hall of Fame guests. We've had ADs. We've had coaches. We've had players. We've had Maury Povich. Who have we not... Like, what, what genre have we not yet ventured in? Yeah, we, we've even had Manny, who, who I don't know what you are and categorize him as. The only thing we haven't done is we haven't gotten the girl who was in Playboy. Do, do we need to get her on the show? Uh, yeah, which one are we talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, uh, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we, uh, oh. I think like famous celebrities like uh, like a Cheryl Hines or Daniel Tosh, I guess, is the only other avenue we haven't. Yeah, that there actually been that went to UCF, not the Maury Povich. But oh, that's fair. I don't know. I don't know where else to go. I mean, we'll, we'll keep trying. Maybe we'll bring in, you know, NFL players professors. and coaches, professors, Boehm, <laughs> the Boehm collector. <laughs> Is he out there still? Susan. Oh, yeah. Disgruntled fans. Yeah. That, we're, so we're going full Maury then. We're actually just going to change the show. <laughs> just, <laughs> we're just going to go full Maury Povich uh, based on our, our, our interview for next week. All right. Well, cows, uh, they uh, they happen each week and uh, and you get to pick one. You decided over the break who yours is, and uh, and everyone is eagerly awaiting the announcement, Mike. All right. I got a few different cows, I guess. You're, you're One, sure. we'll start out with um, – today I saw that UConn signed a deal with CBS Sports Network to show their home football games this upcoming season and all the way through 2023, which I guess is a good job out of, out of UConn, right? Yeah. We didn't expect them to get their own deal that – you're getting somebody to show them on TV. I mean, it is CBS Sports Network, which we know will make a football game last about eight hours. So <laughs> if you were used, ready to watch UConn football, get ready, because that's it's going to be from 12 o'clock to about 630 for one <laughs> one football game. That sounds just but, dreadful. <laughs> by the way. Eight hours of UConn football, my gosh. But um, I, they, I still haven't seen the actual numbers from that deal. So I, they said it was a seven-figure deal. I don't know if that's per year or if that's for the whole life of the contract and what that all equals out to. So 
that we still got to get. So they may be cows just for that deal still. But the, the, what I'm getting the cow is uh, they were taking quotes coming out of there, and, and one of them was from Randy Edsel, head coach, and he was talking about how this deal is really helping recruiting, which I don't know how it could really help so far because it just got announced today, number one. And number two, they still have zero recruits committed for this season. <laughs> it's coming up. So how much is it really helping Randy Edsel? That's what I want to know. So he, he's a cow. The whole deal may be cow worthy. Uh, but I'll give them credit for now for actually getting their own deal done. I didn't see that coming. Did you? I did not know. I wasn't uh, wasn't tracking the UConn television contract. Although that's probably just – I'm trying to read through it now while you're talking. Is that That's for football only? Is that, how, is that, is that correct? All right. Four football home games this season. And I think they have one or two other games that they, they need to get somewhere else to put it on TV because they're not doing all the games. And then it's every home football game, I believe, until 2023. And they're trying to they, – they do have a couple uh, P5 teams coming in. I think they have Indiana coming in and a couple others. Tennis, I think they're working Tennessee, on Boston College. Uh, yeah, Boston College, yeah. And, and Syracuse. They're going to keep it local to teams up there, which makes sense. And if they can do it, good for them. Yeah, we're not going to miss UConn. They're just going to get steamrolled by all those teams, yeah. just like they did in the American. So, but uh, oh, you know what was cool though? I, now that they're out of the American, I did see the odds of, of the. <laughs> did you see that odds of winning the American Conference this year? I did, and we were even money, the number one team. Yeah. You see who was last? I did. The cows at a hundred to one. <laughs> one hundred to one. That's the odds of us winning the national championship, right? One hundred to one. Uh, that's their chances of winning the American. Yeah, we, that we are a hundred times better than, than the cows. That's <laughs> literally how you how you. We are one hundred times better than the cows. Right? Yeah, we're even money, which is a lot, by the so, way. So yeah, the cows could be a cow for that, and then one other cow. For uh, <laughs> he just introduced the segment, and I, maybe I'm doing this every week. I'm picking a UCF guy to be a cow every week. Yeah, because this week is going to be Danny White himself. Okay. I know what are we doing anyway. The guy's giving out uh, fan shout outs on Twitter, and we weren't one of them. No. And he's got Libby. Yeah. Which, you know, everybody likes Everybody seems to like Libby. Libby seems like a nice girl and everything. But Libby's not even the biggest fan in her own family. Nelson. Oh. I mean, give Nelson a shout out. I'll take right? Nelson. Yeah. Nelson, we, we're rooting for you, buddy. I don't know how you didn't get in there. Yeah. Danny White's going to give a, a shout out to anybody in that family. It's got to be Nelson. Nelson's our guy. That's our guy. And his gnome, Ohana. So. <laughs> well, to be fair, Danny and I are close. I, I actually tweeted at him, and he uh, he responded, Mike. He quote tweeted me back. Uh, so really, uh, it was I just it was just you who didn't get any Danny White love this weekend. <laughs> I did see that. I forgot about that. The golf cart. I meant to mention that. Yeah. Uh, nice golf cart you got there. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I, I got some. I got some good compliments on that. Uh, the sticker came out nice. The decal came out nice. Uh, you still may get a nitro head on the side there, but yeah, Danny, Danny seemed to be uh, seemed to be a big fan. Yeah, he said it was big time. That's right. I forgot, so he did respond to you. Yeah, damn. So maybe he's not a cow. Well, it's, well, oh, well. it's just you, really. Is what? But have you have you <laughs> tweeted at him? That's the thing. Have you said anything to Danny? No, I've never tweeted at him. I've well, we need to work this out. What could you tweet at Danny? Um, what could you tweet at Danny that you think would get a response? Uh, ask him if he heard our Maury Povich or anything, ah, that's probably not going to work so you need something he can't say no to like kids get your kids involved mm-hmm. um, you know have your kids you know I wish my dad was as good as Danny White something like that right you need, <laughs> <laughs> you need something he can't say no to like you, you can't you can't say no to kids or you know something you got to find something that, that's hard to argue with right because he's not going to want to take a stance like because if he says he likes Maury Povich then they're like oh I can't believe you like that trash blah 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 right so it's going to have to be pretty neutral everyone's pro golf card who's the anti golf card crowd out there so I figured that was a safe tweet so you got to find something that um, is there an anti golf card crowd <laughs> um, I got to find I mean I guess if it wasn't battery charged but yours, you got all the angles covered it's battery if, yeah if you were um, using gas yeah it's battery I'm plugging that thing in um so you got to find something safe. I don't know. We got we should we should workshop this. What can you what can you tweet at at Danny? Um, you know that that'll get him in response to you. Do you think he could just come on and say, "Hey, Adam and Mike, you do a great job on Sunday." You think he would admit he listens, or does he listen? Who knows? Uh, three questions in one. Great. Do I think he'll come on? No. Do I think he listens? No. <laughs> do I think he say he does? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I'm don't always think amazed. He's ever heard this show? Not even ah. the, the Gol interview or the Maury Povich interview. Or himself saying, "If you don't want to be the cow of the week," I'd like to think so, man. I, I mean, 
you know, I, I try to be pretty humble about, I mean, we're not, we're just two, you know, small time idiots, right. Who just, you know, record, you know, at middle of the middle of the night, every Monday. Right. Like, so I, I try not to get too big headed about this. I'd like to think at some point he's heard us say something about something. You met him. He knows that it exists. If you paid attention that night, he did a promo. I don't know if he remembers it, but I'd like to think he's at least heard, heard snippets of it here or there. I would think he would have to, eh? whether he admits it or not. But I, I would think he, at some point he's had to have at least tuned in to see what the hell we were talking about. We we're talking about his school, you know. Yeah. And we do have some people that listen. And I would think he he'd have to have heard us at some point. Again, I, I'd like to hope so. You think Hypo listens? You think Hypo listens on a regular basis? <sighs> I feel like Hypo doesn't do anything on a regular <laughs> basis. Like I feel like he doesn't have enough patience for this. Hypo, no, that's where you're wrong. Hypo does everything on a regular basis. This is not it. <laughs> Listening to us is not one of the things. That's fair. Everything he does, he does regularly. If he does, he listens on like four speed. Like he's he's got us on like four X. Like he doesn't have time for this nonsense. <laughs> he definitely fast forwards through Cow of the Week if he does. He hasn't heard a top eight list in his life. I mean, maybe the interviews he listens into and you know some of our comments off the top. But yeah, he's he's moving through this thing pretty quickly. <laughs> Not the hypo translator. <laughs> he might actually listen to that. He might be taking pointers. <laughs> I'm dying to know. Like, if I, I'd love for him to just like drop us a secret signal one day that he listens by like trying to do some like repeat something we said. If he said that back in a press conference, I would, I would, we would re- retire the show right there. <laughs> and he kind of did it when he did the shacket video. It's true. Okay? It's true. He came out and he did the picking the shacket out of the closet. Then whether that was his, I don't think it was his idea, but somebody that listens probably brought the idea to him. Maybe. We, we were one of the first to start talking about the shackets, right? I feel like we were, we were very early adopters of the, of the shacket theory. I don't. It's hard to claim who was first on these things. I feel like we were in the pool early. My other favorite thing, by the way, every time we have a guest, and I love all our guests, by the way, so please, if you're listening and you haven't been a guest and you want to be a guest, we absolutely do want you to be a guest. But I love how when we end the interviews, they always thank us for all we do and we appreciate your show, blah, blah, blah. And you know half these guys have never listened to our show a day in their life. <laughs> I have no clue who we are. But if they're very nice at the end. They're always like, appreciate you guys for what you do and keep it up. I'm, I'm glad for all your success and yada, yada, yada. I always love that. That's my favorite part of the show is when the interviewees <laughs> like give, give us like mad love at the end and it's just kind of weird. And you're like, thanks, man. We appreciate it. That's my favorite. I know. Part. I always want to ask them. So you actually listen to the show? You've heard? <laughs> I think you have before. Well, the, the only guy that actually told us that he listened before we even interviewed him was Dexter Lyons. You remember that? Yes, I do. You, I asked Dexter to come yeah. on the show. He's like, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, look, I listened to you guys. I heard the show last week. I was impre- I was shocked. I was like, really? I've had a few <laughs> uh, I've had a few guys I've reached out to, and they've acknowledged that they know who we are. They've heard of us. Um, who Anthony Roberson, I think, had said something to the effect that we listen to your show all the time. Um, I think a couple of guys that tell me I knew so-and-so was on your show, like Hayden Kingston comes to mind. I think he said something like that. Um, so I think some of the, some of the guys maybe listen in for the interview parts, um, on, on some of the, some of the people. Um, but you know, whether they want right. to you know, follow us or not, I guess it's another story. Yeah. yeah. The, the kids that are just now out of school and they're doing their interviews, I, I would think that some of the friends on the team listen to those interviews and, and we know a lot of the parents probably listen because i think a bunch of them follow us on twitter and stuff they probably listen to see if we say anything about their kids right we're big, with, we're big with the parents big with the parents yeah speaking of twitter we're, I'm, so, we're so close to like a thousand followers how do we get over a thousand what, what do you think do we need to do something special here do i do a giveaway or something trade chocolate style do we have anything to give away <laughs> you're gonna clean out your closet and just give away whatever you got. <laughs> I, I, by the I, way I, i'm yeah. all for it trace that's a perfect spring cleaning um situation i'm, I'm all for it. that's that's an ingenious idea I have a box of crap here somewhere. I don't know how can you find something. All right. Mike has a box of crap. We are at 950 <laughs> followers as we speak right now. If we can get 50 more followers by the same time next week, so one week from today, we will Mike will go into his box of crap and we will <laughs> see what we have and we will send you something. Or I've been kicking around getting merch made, Mike. I know we got the new logo. We've had the new logo now for like a year. Um, shout out to Chris Robinson, by the way, for that. And uh, maybe we get some new logo stuff made up, send it out to some people. I want to send Moria shirt. If we can get Moria Sons UCF shirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. We get him to post it on Twitter or something. What if we can get Maury? If you are the thousandth follower, I'll see if I can get Maury to like leave you a voicemail or something. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. There are websites where you can have celebrities call you and leave messages and stuff. Yeah, so you got to pay, pay for that stuff. <laughs> I was just hoping. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we, 
we could have Maury call and tell somebody whether they're the father right now. That'd be awesome. Yeah, maybe we can get more we can do that. autograph something for you. I don't know. Let's just get to a thousand. We're so close to a thousand or nine fifty. Get us over a thousand and we'll we'll figure out a way to take care of you guys. Um I don't know how we'll decide what to do. We'll we'll do like a trivia contest or something. Um, you know, we'll figure it out. Um I haven't given my cow of the week really quick. So um my cow of the week, Mike, there was a protest today. And so I'm not this is not a uh, a political statement. I could, you know, protest what you want to protest. I'm not opining on that. I am opining upon how they protested. Uh, some folks in Clearwater, of course, by the way, um they were protesting that uh, the gyms are not yet open by going outside and working out. So they were standing on the front, I don't know, of the capital of St. Pete, I'm not sure exactly where that was. They were standing out front of this place and they were all doing squats and push-ups to protest that the gyms were not open. I feel like that's your when you're when you're working out outside and you're saying you need the gyms open. I feel like you're kind of defeating the purpose of of why uh, or of what the protest is about. I get you why you do it for attention. Plus, I'm just so sick. Like I'm I'm a native native ish Floridian. Lived here most of my life. Moved away for a few years. Just came back. People just drag Florida all the time. We get made fun of all the time. We we just don't need any more dumb stuff in Florida. Could you just not do dumb stuff so we can st- stay off the news and not be Florida man and have all the people on the beaches and have the, the idiots doing squats outside the capital of St. Petersburg. Cause they want their gyms open. Can we just keep Florida out of the limelight for a little bit? Jeez. Almighty people. All right. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have the most idiots per capita, I believe in any state in the country. So that's not coming to an end anytime soon. I mean, just look at, there's a whole university full of them. <laughs> so. And maybe that explains now that it explains how all that happened, because if you actually watch this video in detail, um, th- there are some, there are some really uh, interesting form issues. There's this one lady trying to do a squat. I don't know where her hand, like her hands are like on the ground. I'm not sure what she's doing. One lady's doing doing ups on her knees. Like if you're going to go outside and hardcore protest, like at least give me some hardcore, you know, you drop down and give me 50 squats. Give me a couple of jump squat burpees. Do something exciting. I mean, there's one one lady did like three squats and stopped. One lady was on the knee push-ups. It wasn't even really that hard a workout for crying out loud. <laughs> the people that are probably, they miss the gym because they miss socializing with people more than anything. Those are people that go to the gym but don't actually work out. So. Probably. Yeah, maybe that's what they're missing. I mean, I get it. I, I want stuff to be open too. We all want to get back to normal, right? Everyone wants to do it safely, and so there's all kinds of reasons why people think that's good or bad, and who the you know that's that's your personal decision. But uh, these people just cows of the week for going outside to pro to, going outside to work out to protest that they can't go in the gym and work out, and then to actually just not even really work out really well uh, is just that's just cow of the week worthy. So, uh, gym protesters, you are my cow of the week. <laughs> You working out still? So you you always work out in the garage anyway. Right? I got the garage gym set up. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, still getting after it every morning. Uh, you know, uh, with working from home and the kids, it's a little harder than it used to be. I used to get up in the morning by myself, and the kids were still asleep, so I got all the time in, in the world I needed. Now that I can sleep in a little bit, you know, kids are sleeping in, so I can't really make that much noise. So uh, yeah, I'm still getting after it every day. Got it. Got a good one. Got a good wad in on uh, on Saturday and Sunday. This morning, more more okay. more core, more cardio. You know, some smabs, you know, some light stretching, kind of taking it easy, you know, kind of a recovery day. Cool. Yeah, I've been on the Peloton a lot more lately. And actually, there's a UCF alumni tag. They, they started these tags, so I'm kind of in that group. Uh, it's pretty cool. You get to see the other UCF people that are on the Peloton. I haven't done a class with any of them at the same time. Let's we'll see what that happens. A couple of them followed me on there. Of course they did. So I wonder if they listen to this show. Well, or They just like the name, Iron Mike Siphon. <laughs> it's, it's, so the instructor is not a UCF grad they're just people who went to UCF yeah yeah so it's a it's just tags so it's like hashtags okay so okay. Um, one of them is called UCF alumni that's the one I joined and there, there's other ones you know, Peloton Moms is another one stuff like that Peloton Moms but the, the group I, I noticed the group when I joined it there was like 40 something I was up over 100 I don't even know what the number is at now it's growing by the day there's a lot of UCF people on the Peloton well, let's get them on the show. Let's get the UCF Peloton group on <laughs> on the show for uh, for an interview sometime soon. Maybe next week, Mike, because we are we are on uh, the schedule each and every Wednesday morning on the Nightline Sports Network. If you subscribe, we pop up in your feed automatically. That's the easiest way to do things. If you don't subscribe, shame on you. Go find us there now and subscribe. You can find us on all of the major podcast platforms. 
Uh, we've actually already got next week's guest lined up, Mike. It's a good one. And so this is the first time I'll actually do a tease with some confidence that I can actually deliver on this for next week. So next week's guest is a good one. Um, someone you haven't heard a lot from uh, in this setting before. So you're going to want to check back next week. But hopefully you enjoyed this week's episode and the previous episodes. If you want to hear any of these old episodes, by the way, nightlinesports.com is where you want to go. They are all archived there. We will keep you entertained for days and days and days and in the days in between uh, here and there you can find us on twitter at sons of ucf or at ucf mike one and again we'll be back next wednesday mike here on the uh the nightline sports network that's right i, I think i looked at our our show total so far i think it's 82 shows i think there's over 183 hours 108 now like 185 hours of listening to us talk so oh, good God. <laughs> you know there's some people that have probably heard every episode cost seg advisor and there's gotta be a couple uh, one or two that have heard every episode i, I don't think Danny one has listened to every episode i don't think i've but, heard uh, every episode <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure how other people have there's gotta be somebody that's listened to every yeah i don't i don't know mike i again i haven't listened to every episode I'm, i i know you haven't <laughs> so uh you know but hey look anyone who's willing to listen to us for however long you're willing to listen to us for we appreciate you greatly and uh and we'll we keep doing this for you guys this is what we do the show to to hopefully hear you hear comments afterwards and let you hear from people who were uh, important to you and just have a place where you can come learn about UCF for crying out loud and uh, and, and do that each and every Wednesday. Only on Nightline Sports Network. That's that's Is that worth- usually your line. I mean, I you can say it if you want to. Why don't you, why don't you hit the outro? Here you go. Ready? UCF Mike takes us out. All right, come back next week when we have another big time guest, and we can promise this like Adam already said. Only on the Nightline Sports Network. Go Knights. Charge on. Perfect. Look at you. You're, you're a pro, Mike. Way to go. <laughs>